Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to call the Board of Education meeting for May 25th, 2003 to order. Trustee Van Gimmeret, please, um, please take attendance. All board members are present. Can we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so we're going to move on to item number two, special recognition. We like to celebrate the success of our forensic state champions. Um, if we can bring uh, Danielle Tier. Students being honored for today. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm honored to stand before you today to celebrate the Bloomfield Hills High School forensics students that received first and second place awards at the 2023 state championship. Um, students that place first include Justice Southburn, so you guys can come up, um, 12th grade uh, for poetry interpretation, Paul Abdelnor, um, also 12th grade for dramatic interpretation, Sarah Haddad, grade 12, sales speaking, and the multiple interpretation group next to normal. And tonight we have um, Lauren Capellian and David Labont here for that group. So come on up. And then additionally, um, we had the second place multiple interpretation group as well. And tonight we have Zoe Debris here to represent. Um, so the competition took place on April 28th and 29th at Wayne State University. Um, the Michigan Interscholastic Forensics Association empowers students to become proficient and ethical communicators, critical thinkers, lifelong learners, and leaders in a democratic society through interscholastic speech, theater, and debate activities for middle and secondary school students. Overall, Bloomfield Hills High School placed third in the Class A tournament. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> So continue with our celebration of success. Um, item 2B, Michigan DECA State Conference, Tina Cavanaugh. Hello, um, I am so pleased to be here today uh, to recognize our um, Bloomfield Hills High School DECA champions, um, not only state champions, but international as well. Uh, eight students from our high school team advanced to the International Career Development Conference, which is a um, 
a huge conference every year, and this year it was Orlando, Florida. We sent a record eight students, and um, two of which were national champions. Uh, it was a four-day event uh, that's the highest level of DECA competition, um, the best of the best from high schools across Canada, Mexico, um, Puerto Rico, and a, com a couple countries in Europe. And we finished on top with uh, Two finalists in the top 10, um, one who couldn't be here at the lacrosse game tonight, um, Nick Gettler, who was fourth place overall um, in hotel and lodging management. Uh, he competed against 40 people for that top four spot. And um, in a 100 question exam in business management. And um, yeah, fourth place overall. So that, good job, Nick. <laughs> We also had our junior Eileen C, who was our mega champion, uh, brought home the DECA Glass Trophy for a third place win in a prepared event, Entrepreneurship Innovation Plan. Um, she was a standout in this field. It's one of the hardest DECA competitions, um, and she did it all on her own and created a um, uh, innovation for a real world problem and built a business plan around it and um, put a little personal spin on that. And as a first year advisor, very proud, very proud of our whole team. Um, and uh, yeah, the whole thing was very award worthy. Also, we had our um, internet integrated marketing campaign team, uh, Forrest, Omer, and Alex uh, placed 96th overall, 96% top on your presentation. And um, Evan Friday in accounting applications, Jack Victor in principles of business management, and Ben Gettler, who uh, also could not be here in entrepreneurship. So. Come on. Next, we have the Presidential Scholars and Semi-Finalists, Lynn Gibson. Good evening. Um, I'm honored to stand before you today to honor, honor a few International Academy students. Um, could I please have Adnan Khan um, Ching Ching Ouyang, she couldn't be here tonight, but her mom's here, so Mrs. Ouyang, if you could come up. And uh, we also have, um, am I missing one? Audit, sorry. <laughs> Audit Jane. So we're going to start with Adnan. So Adnan, if you could step forward. Okay. Um, Adnan was named a 2023 Presidential Scholar. He is among only 161 high school seniors in the nation named Presidential Scholars for their accomplishments in academics, the arts, 
and career and technical education fields. He is one of only two students in Michigan to receive this level of distinction. Um, in announcing this 59th class of United States Presidential Scholars, U.S. Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona said, quote, U.S. Presidential Scholars have always represented the future of our country and the bright promise it holds. I want each of these remarkable students to know your passion and intellect, pursuit of excellence, and spirit of service are exactly what our country needs. On behalf of President Biden, I am delighted to join your family, friends, and communities in celebrating your accomplishments. Aim high, share your talents, and continue embracing opportunities to lead as your exciting future unfolds. I certainly echo these sentence sentiments. Congratulations. Okay. Um, if we could have audit and Mrs. O. Yang, Sam Ward. Um, we're also celebrating um, these IA students who were honored as 2023 Presidential Scholar semifinalists. These students were honored for their accomplishments in academics, the arts, and career and technical education fields, and are among only 13 students in Michigan to receive this recognition. The White House Commission of Presidential Scholars selects scholars annually based on their academic success, artistic and technical excellence, essays, school evaluations and transcripts, as well as a demonstrated commitment to community service and to leadership. The Presidential Scholars Class of 2023 will be recognized for their outstanding achievement this summer. Congratulations to our International Academy students. Next, we have 2D, BHHS, Cyberhawks. We have Bridget Krenchinko. Did I say that correctly? Kravchinko. Krav, the V is not silent. Kravchinko. Thank you so much, Bridget. Okay, if I could um, call up Alex Hyatt, Eileen Tsai, Jacob Irie, Douglas Kravchenko, and we also had BJ Data and Adnan Rashid, both of them could not be here. We had a team of six, and I'm extremely honored to stand here before the Board of Education and Superintendent Watson. I saw him sitting there. Behind oh, you. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, honoring this next generation of cyber defenders. Uh, they competed in the Cyber Patriot 15th competition, and they placed second in the state of Michigan. This team also qualified for the platinum tier, which this is the highest level and the most difficult tier to compete in. They placed in the top 5% um, nationally. Here are some of the numbers. 2,000 schools competed overall. 
in Michigan alone, 95 um, schools competed and the Cyberhawks took second place. Only 641 schools qualified for the platinum tier of the 2000. So um, by, during this competition, the Cyberhawks competed as a newly hired IT professional tasked with managing and defending. They had to defend against viruses, attacks on the system, and defending a small network in the company. And they competed on virtual images, Windows 10, Server 2019, Ubuntu, which is a version of Unix or Linux, Cisco Packet Tracer, which is a network simulation tool, and a network quiz. I would like to congratulate them for their accomplishments accomplishments this year, and thank you. Next we have um, item 2E, agenda item number 2E, um, celebrating success, deaf and hard of hearing national award winners storytelling contest. We have Jason Rubel. Uh, thank you, Board of Education. I actually have the easy part, so I'm inviting up uh, Diana Campbell and uh, Jackie Lozano and Charlotte Jorge and Drew, if you could come on up to hear a little bit about um, a competition that they won. But I'd also like to say I had the good fortune today um, at East Hills, we held a DHH celebration. And I'm just so proud of the community that we have built and uh, the way that Diana and Jackie and of course all of our DHH staff play in creating community, but most importantly, the role that our students have as a K-12 and uh, beyond experience. So it's pretty special uh, to have that at East Hills and moving into North Hills, of course. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, the talent, uh, but our staff here to share a little more uh, about what occurred. Thank you, Mr. Rubel. So we're here tonight to honor our students who they did an amazing job. First, we have Drew Ginther, who is an eighth grader. We have Jorge Torres Mendoza, who is also an eighth grader. And we have Charlotte Morgan as an eighth grader as well. All of our DHH students had to create a videotape that was made and sent to Boston for a national competition, the Marie Jean Phillips competition. Um, and they're based in Boston, Massachusetts. This competition is intended for audiences. Um, it's open to students across the country um, in order to celebrate deaf culture, deaf history, ASL, and advocacy. Um, for themselves. I would like to introduce first Drew Ginther, our eighth grader who won first place in his age group for an ASL poem. His poem was about a personal hero and the, his personal hero is actually an alumnus of our DHH program. His name is Sean Forbes and he's a famous deaf musician. Thank you. 
Next, we have Jorge Torres Mendoza. He, as an eighth grader, he also won first place in his age group for an ASL story. His story focused on his hero, who is Rolando Siguenza, who is a famous Mexican deaf artist. Next, we have Charlotte Morgan. She is an eighth grader who won second place in her age group, competing for an ASL story, focusing on her hero, Helen Keller, who is a famous deaf blind woman. As a group, our seventh and eighth grade student, students work very hard researching, creating, writing, acting, and editing their personal pieces, whether they be stories, art, or poems. This competition had to be, for the competition, they had to video record their submissions, and these were sent and all of their pieces had to adhere to the rules of the competition theme for this year, which was their hero. Thank you. Continuing our celebrating of success, we have the girls varsity soccer state champions and Ellen Carzaria. Thank you. Um, thank you to the Board of Education for honoring our team. Um, I'm gonna ask all of our girls to come up, please. Okay, I'm honored to stand before you today to celebrate the 2022 BHHS state champion girls soccer team. Uh, the 2022 Bloomfield Hills High School women's soccer team is the first soccer team ever since Bloomfield Hills High School was established in 2013 to win a state championship title. It is also the first Bloomfield Hills High School soccer team in over 20 years to earn the title. Going into the playoffs, the team was ranked 12th in their division, but went on to beat multiple higher ranked teams in the regional and semifinal matches before finally defeating the number one ranked team at the state finals in a penalty kick shootout. I can also let you know that throughout the, the playoffs, uh, the team dealt with um, having to play a man down in a game, uh, being down a goal, uh, and coming back and, and showing extreme resilience, uh, mental toughness, and fortitude to go back and to win those games and to move on and win the state championship. Uh, furthermore, after the season was completed, uh, the, the team was ranked number 23 in the country. Oh, wow. So those being honored from the team are Ava Badayo, Drew Martin, Emma Merchant, Esther Rosette, Alice Spiegel, Charlotte Carlton, Brooke Green, Avery Hall, Lola Halsband, Jenna Ofira, Jakaya O'Rourke, Ava Duquette, J. 
Joelle Lawar, Jenica Opdahl, Tess Wright, Lauren Cusin, Lily Amon, Emma Henry, Avery Law, Elena Perota, and Sophia Spano. Please give them a round of applause. Congratulations, <laughs> congratulations again to all of our, our students and their marvelous successes. We're going to move on to um, item 3A, public comment. Public comment is an opportunity for the public to address the Board of Education. It's not a time for dialogue. In the interest of time, the Open Meetings Act provides the board may place time limits and allotments for an individual comment. In addition to making public comment, you may also email the Board of Education at any time. Any comment that contains profanity, threats, defamatory remarks, or is directed at any person not employed by the district or a member of the Board of Education in their official capacity and related to the role and responsibilities for which they are employed or serve, or is otherwise exempt from the First Amendment protection, will be excluded from the public comment. If you are speaking on behalf of a group or an organization, please identify who you represent. Thank you for your time uh, in addressing the Board of Education. You will have three minutes to provide public comment. And Trustee Hill, are you taking the time yes. for us? Thank you. Our first public comment is Chris Decker. Hi there, thanks for listening. I know I'm not gonna rehash what happened last week with uh, the baseball fields and the transportation center, but I do wanna ask a question. What would have happened if the mom in, that told us about this hadn't heard about it? It sounded like all systems were go. There was a survey done on the property. We watched meeting minutes where you guys sat and listened to the idea, everyone listened to it, nobody said, wait a minute, that's crazy. Um, actually, I think Mr. Watson, you did say, we promised to move the transportation center. Thank you for advocating for us in our East Hills, East Over community. Um, I'm glad that that crisis is over, but what would have happened if the parents had not gotten wind of it? You weren't very forthright about telling us what was going on. None of us, none of us in Eastover and East Hills knew about it. Um, so I guess my next question is, how are you going forward going to uphold the promises of the bond? One of the promises was moving the transportation center and in talking to a few of you this week, it doesn't sound like you're planning on doing that anymore. So um, the main thing is we don't want our East Hills slash Eastover school to become the dumping ground for you know, more buses, physical plant services, their trucks, I don't know what's involved in that, but um, I've heard different rumors about what's going on with other properties, and it feels like East Hills is just getting kind of lumped in with let's put less desirable stuff over there. We don't want it. We were promised to get rid of it. We want our green space. We want less traffic, not more. Um, so just please, please, we hear this word, I've been here for 10 years, transparency. I know we all are sick of it, but it's true, it comes up again, board after board. Please be transparent, please let us know what the plans are. Please be honest about what's happening with the property and what your plans are for the transportation center, physical plant services, whatever. Um, we're concerned about the way that that 
email to us was worded, that it's not going on the fields. It doesn't say that it's not going in the parking lot or adding on to the back of the building. So please be honest uh, with what's going on with that situation and all. That's all that we ask, and we can avoid all of that, all of the unpleasantries. So thank you. Thank you. Maureen? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maureen Fian Kurth. Um, my daughter, Hope, is a student at the Wing Lake Developmental Center. Uh, and I'm here today to talk about um, some of the center based funds that you have left over. Um, we would really like to see some of those funds go to Wing Lake and not be dispersed elsewhere. As you know, these students are the most vulnerable students in Oakland County. They don't get much more vulnerable than our kids. We are in the process of trying to do some renovations to our playground to make it even more adaptable. Ask any Wing Lake parent, there are very few playgrounds that we can take our kids to. And the fact that our playground has been closed for two years, that's a whole nother issue. I did email Mr. Watson about that. It's very upsetting because we would love to be able to use it. We have kids with limited mobility. But anyhow, we're in the process of trying to raise $130,000 to make our playground more inclusive. We're going to all these lengths to raise this money. And I understand you have in excess of a million dollars in this center-based fund. Please put it towards where it goes, which is to our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Kim, Kim Cost. I will make sure that I send a note to the superintendent's office to be distributed to you. You can jump in at any time and know that the resources that are being made available in this initiative are unparalleled and they are all free. And if you have noon Friday available, jump into our community dialogue roundtable. And I'm very proud to say I'm the only board member at United Way that also serves as a dialogue facilitator. And who knows, you might end up in my session, which would be really, really fun. Um, we walk the talk at United Way. This is to help us learn, and we are committed to seeing that our communities have access to the same resources we do when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, with that, I do have a concern. Um, That's three minutes. You know what? I will leave it at that, and I will make sure I follow up with you because there is something I'd like to follow up with. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're Larry Lloyd. And then after Larry is Margie. Hello. Uh, I am Larry Lloyd. I'm a resident of the Bloomfield Crossing neighborhood. I'm also the president of the Bloomfield Crossing Homeowners Association. And uh, I'm here also about the Transportation Center. Uh, unfortunately, we did not receive the email that's been referenced uh, uh, by a couple of speakers, so uh, we're kind of in the dark as to the status of you know, that potential location of uh, East Hills. I will echo the comments of uh, those before me. Uh, so we would like you know, to know the you know, status of the proposal, because we do have some concerns. Uh, one green uh, is eliminating one, two, or even three baseball fields by paving them over. Is that truly a, a green behavior? Uh, two, the safety for children. Uh, if our children in our neighborhood would not have access to cut through the end of the neighborhood to get to those fields, to get to school, then not very safe for them to go on Kensington Road to get to uh, school because there's no sidewalk there. Uh, thirdly, uh, unsightly and unappealing uh, versus having some green space, and that would devalue you know, the homes. Uh, so we would really appreciate uh, and request alternative locations or uh, designs are seriously considered and that we have some access to what is the status? What's going on? Uh, what are the details? What's the design? Uh, is it on the table? 
to locate uh, buses, EV buses, and stations, and equipment, and lights, and security fences, et cetera, right behind our houses, uh, or, or not. Uh, and if there is some access, a website, or whatever, we sure would like to hear it. All right, well, thank you for everything you do. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Margie Tarowski. After Margie is Began. Hi, I'm Margie Tarowski. I have three children attending school in the district. Uh, we've loved our experiences at East Dover and East Hills and are so thankful for the amazing teachers and staff and leadership in both of the buildings. I want to thank all of you for the email that was sent yesterday to district families informing us that current East Hills baseball and soccer fields are no longer an option being considered by the district um, for the transportation department's placement. My son's team is playing baseball, um, a game right now on those fields. At this moment, in that green space, those fields are essential in our community. Um, along with the thank you, I do also want to inquire where the future plant services and transportation department will be placed. I'm hoping that this will be addressed later on tonight at this meeting. Um, when the bond proposal was presented to families in the community, we were told that there was a need for a new transportation department space because the new buses will not fit the current maintenance garage area. Um, so if the current lot is not sustainable as the home for future fleets, it would be great just to know kind of what our other solutions might be. Um, will that original $3 million of the $200 million bond that was set aside to purchase land and what was told would be an industrial area, would that still be utilized in that capacity? Um, I'm just hoping for commitment from the board that the East Hill site will not come back on the table as a possible space in the future. And on that note, I do want to emphasize the need to keep our schools green spaces. The fields and baseball diamonds, they're places to run throughout the entire district, you know? We're a community that doesn't really have public parks. There's very few sidewalks. We're still an amazing community, though. <laughs> um, the school district's green space is the park area for Bloomfield. We need to ensure that our children, families, and community have places nearby that are safe spaces to gather, play, and run. It's essential to the physical health and well-being of our students, family, and community to have places like this to go. Organized sports teams practice and play games. There's pickup games with friends and families. They happen on all of the fields in our district, across the district throughout the year. Access to these sites spread throughout the district is imperative. So as you plan what Bloomfield School's future footprint will look like, please keep this in mind. I also want to thank you all for everything you do for our schools and families. I know that it is a thankless thing a lot of the time. Um, you give a lot of time and energy to our community by being on the board. And I also do want to thank you for tonight placing the overall well-being of our Eastover and East Hills students and community first by keeping the fields where so many kids run, play, and even walk through to get to school green. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Megan Preston. Press, Preston. And then Chris Kiesel after Megan. Good evening. Um, our community passed a $200 million bond that made promises and earmarked money to be used for very specific purposes. It is not a binding agreement. I understand that. I guess because it passed, you can now rewrite it and do whatever you want. Not surprisingly, there's very little information remaining online that would outline how the money would be spent. I, like Kim, found a single sentence under the community notes after pouring through pages and links for hours. But when many of us have the same recollection, when the board deviates from that, it produces a general lack of trust in our community. You may choose to use the money in the way that it was intended and originally communicated or not. But surely you know what you should do, what the right thing to do is. And if you choose to go in a different direction without transparency, the results will be further distrust and strife. And when the need for more money and resources comes up again, which it will, I believe you will come up sorely short on support and needed votes. So to the administration, I ask you to come up with a better plan. We always hear kids first. 
So put the kids first and get creative and present a better plan to the board, please. And to the school board members, please don't pass plans that are lazy and cheap and lack the intelligence and creativity that our community demands. Please think through implications and consequences. Get community input if needed on the important things, not just what to name the new preschool or what mascots the middle schools should have. Please represent the community that elected you to your position and don't take the easy and cheap way out. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Kiesel, followed by Cynthia Van Owen. While I'm walking up, I'll apologize for how quickly I have to speak because I know my time is limited. Um, my name is Chris Kessel, and I am here to discuss the central fund money being spent for things that are not special education related. My son Liam is six years old, and he's a student at Wing Lake, and so obviously this issue is near and dear to my heart and directly impacts my family. Now, as I understand it, this board is considering taking this action for two reasons. The first is that you guys are under the impression that the kids at Wing Lake and the teachers have everything that they need. And respectfully, I'm here to tell you that is not true. I know this is true, and you know this is true, because in about 10 days, myself, my wife, and friends that I've corralled are attending a fundraiser where we as parents have to raise $130,000 for phase one of an upgrade to playground equipment at Wing Lake. What this means is that the special needs parents that are here and at home watching, we have to spend countless hours and dollars in our own home securing, making it safe and accessible for our kids. And then we have to come back and we have to spend more hours and more dollars, sorry, more hours and more dollars making sure that our kids' playground at school is safe and accessible and educational for them. Now I know that playground equipment doesn't sound like it's educational per se, but what you have to understand is that this equipment can allow kids to learn gross motor and fine motor skills. It can be used for musical education, which in some cases, like for my son, is much of what they are able to learn. Now in addition, this money could be used for a number of different things, like increasing wheelchair accessibility at district locations like Bowers Farms, something my son and other kids could also appreciate. Updated activity chairs in schools, and upgraded, um, activity boards in classrooms so that kids can participate. My point is that this list is not exhaustive, but the kids and the teachers do not have everything they need. Now the other reason this appears to be being considered is coupled with, and again respectfully, what I could only call a profound sense of disappointment that I felt when I watched this topic be discussed at the most recent meeting. A number of people here said that they would vote for this or they would consider this because this is what's been done or this is how we do things. And respectfully, that is a lazy way of thinking. And I don't believe any of the students who were honored here tonight would use that kind of thinking if they encountered a problem and they didn't know what to do. I'm here to ask you all to do better than what has been done, to be better than what has been done. I know some of you have run recently and your signs were all over my neighborhood, which is great, but none of you ran on the slogan, vote for me, I'm just gonna do what's been done. I know at prior meetings, and I've seen you talk about why you ran, and it was to have positive impacts in your community, to um, help the educational system that your kids are part of. This is your opportunity to do that. Now, the last thing, and I'm sure I'm running out of time, and I may throw all my notes, is that I know that nobody here you know, woke up one morning and decided they were gonna stick it to the special needs families and kids in this district. I don't believe that, and I don't think anybody believes that. But you have to understand what you're talking about doing is such a slap in the face, excuse me, is such a slap in the face to these families and these kids. You have the opportunity to literally be heroes and help a group of kids and a group of parents. We're not looking for handouts, we just need a little bit of help. And you have the opportunity to do that, to be heroes. And I hope that you seize that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Cynthia Van Owen, followed by Don Greenwell. Good evening. As a Board of Education, the most important thing you will do is select a new superintendent. I appreciate that you are seeking community input through a survey and meetings with the consultants, but it's extremely important that you recognize that every potential candidate will be watching these board meetings and how you work together as a board and how you treat your administrative team and all of our educators. A change in the superintendent is always unsettling time for the whole organization. And as you move towards a decision, it's important that you know your candidate has proven instructional leadership and organizational skills that you respect and trust. You will attract the best candidates 
when they see that this board understands the role of a board member, sets goals in collaboration with the superintendent, and lets them execute their responsibilities. A good candidate will look for a district that has a board that sets policy and goals and stays in their lane, reassuring your whole staff that you will seek a strong, experienced leader is vital during this time of transition. On another note, I will also say I echo a lot of the concerns about the Transportation Center. As a board member, I went out to my community and asked them to vote on the board, on, on the bond, with a move of the Transportation Center as part of the bond. And I've been downhill of the gas fumes of the bus center for the last 35 years, and I really had hoped that this was gonna happen. Thank you, Cynthia. Don Greenwell, followed by Kimberly Cromer. Good evening, Don Greenwell, 36 year re uh, resident of the school district. I, I'm totally confused on the transportation center. So uh, my points might be a little off, but I think they're still valid. In the name of going green, the district apparently needs to expand the transportation center. One of the ideas I've been told was to pave the ball fields immediately adjacent to residential neighborhoods, both in the township and in the city. Jenny, my wife, and I s stood down on the 2000 bond uh, campaign for a variety of reasons, but heard loud and clear the promises of addressing the lack of community green spaces. The plan, this plan would break that promise to the taxpayers. Picture this for a moment. My neighbor, Dr. Shenda, and ourselves have developed on our property a pathway to allow our children and our community to access those fields in East Hills. Picture this, it's cut off. Barbed wire fences, 20 foot high overhead uh, parking lot lights. And of course, a major unknown, still out there, but a whisper is a major collection of industrial type batteries. Functionally, I never understood why we're in the busing business. Now, nonetheless, the bus and repair equipment that has been traveling right through the middle school with all of those inherent dangers, but now it's an elementary school. It really needs a better place. I'm sure the board can appreciate today's agenda, too, the irony. Pine Lake, brand new community park. Buying more property for the nature center. Paving the ball fields, expanding the transportation center. And instead of a bus garage with residential frontage, how about the 3,000 feet of expressway frontage we own? We ask the school district, please, preserve the aesthetics, the nature, and the brand of our residential areas, provide a safe operation for our elementary schools, and keep the ball fields and green space for our students and the community. Because once it's gone, it's gone. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Kimberly, followed by Maria Yar. Hi, my name is Kimberly Cromer, and I'm going to read from this. That's fine. <laughs> um, we moved to Bloomfield Hills from Rochester just so our son Elliot could go to Wing Lake Center. I am here today to ask the board please grant Wing Lake Center funds for adaptive equipment and playground needs of $200,000 because plus. At Wing Lake, we have the smallest population of 80 students from 24 cities in Oakland County. We have 32 buses that come every single day to bring our children. We have the most medically fragile and cognitively impaired children in Oakland County. My son wakes up every day at 3.30. Our children have seizures, they have feeding tubes, they have oxygen. They are fragile, fragile children and still deserve as much education as we can give to them. It's impossible for our 80 families in 20 of our districts to fundraise we, while caring for their medically fragile children. Our families have constant medical expenses. We are exhausted parents. We do not have time to raise extraordinary funds of 200,000. Our playground is a space, it's an extension of our classroom, a tool for our children's therapies, sensory needs, and foster socialization, a tool that supports our staff and therapists hourly. I volunteer twice a week. 
I paint at the school. I am on the PTO for fundraising. I am on PAC. Jen Perone has asked me to be the president of PAC. I don't want to be the president of the Gen Ed PAC. I want to take care of our school, our children. And that is why I'm here today. I paint twice a week with the children. We sell t-shirts that we paint. We auction children's artwork. We have family donations. And we have events organized by the teachers. The, Mr. Kessler, the event he was talking about has been coordinated by our staff, our teachers, because they know we are tired. And we are giving 500%, even when we're sleeping, 500. I wake up when my son moves, because I think he's having a seizure. This is not acceptable when there is a center fund for these extraordinary circumstances of special needs. We need adaptive equipment and updates for both wheelchairs and mobile children so they can be together. So my son's wheelchair friends can be on the same piece of equipment with him so they are not isolated. They're already isolated from the world. We need permanent shade for swings, adaptive equipment, and functional tables, picnic tables, to protect our baby's skin from the sun and the heat. Our children do not tolerate sunscreen. They don't wear sunglasses. They will not wear a hat. They will bicker about it. My son already has a tan, and he fights me. So we have to pick our battles, and that is a battle. They're on the playground, and we want them there. Also, we need secured access to our playground seven days a week for specifically Wing Lake families only. We want a key, a keypad, or a key fob for Wing Lake families during non-school hours. The public abused Wing Lake playground and used it as a dog park two years ago. Bloomfield Hills building crew cleaned up 27 bags of I'm dog sorry. waste, cigarettes, and broken bottles on the playground. That's our minutes. children deserve a space to gather that is safe and familiar to them. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Maria Yar Roloso, Rolosen. Are there any other public comments after Maria? Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening. Can you, can you hear me? Everybody yes. hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm Maria Yar Wollison. I live at 572 Tally Ho Court, Bloomfield, 48304. I am a resident <laughs> there for over 30 years, and I live on the cul de sac that backs up to East Hills Middle School parks. Uh, the reason I'm here is because we strongly oppose any suggested um, removal of those ball diamonds and park, uh, and I understand that I guess there has been some update as to whether or not it's going to happen, so excuse me if I'm being, um, if my comments are not appropriate, but I just want to make sure that you are very, very well aware of why we oppose the, um, the uh, demolition of the playing fields in East Hills. First of all, I'd like to suggest that um, my understanding is the present bus lot has existed there since about the 1970s when it serviced more than 10,000 students and our schools operated about 11 institute, K, 11 K through 12 buildings. Again, my understanding now is that the enrollment is about half, 5,000 students and only eight buildings. Um, and what I'd also like to make sure everybody knows about, and I'm sure you're aware of this, if you are ever at the schools in the morning or in the afternoons, you are literally practically run over because there's so many cars and parents dropping their kids off or picking them up. And in other words, I don't know exactly how few kids are actually using these buses to begin with. That's just kind of what I want to say about that. Um, another big thing is the property values. <laughs> being next to a parking structure obviously would have a negative impact on that. And if I can just say one other thing about there's a lot of talk about getting EV buses and things like that, which I'm assuming would be running on lithium batteries. I, am, <laughs> I know an individual who is actually involved very much with an international corporation that is involved in the production of EV batteries that requires a lot of lithium that has to be mined and things like that, and it is a nasty chemical, and so I'm actually uh, very, very concerned about any um, conversion to EV buses as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. 
Seeing no additional public comment, we're gonna move on to superintendent update report, item number four. Thank you, Dr. Southwood. Uh, just a couple brief updates. One, uh, our amazing students this evening. You, you would think after being in education for so long, it, it wouldn't be surprising, but uh, every time I'm just amazed uh, what our students were able to do. And to see the students we had this evening and the awards and their achievements, just amazing. Um, today our prep students held their end of the year celebration and three of our amazing students will be graduating this year. So excited to see them off at a, gra a graduation. Uh, excited to see all of our current eighth graders participating in Move Up Day tomorrow. Uh, next week, we'll be sharing an update with high school students, staff, and families regarding next steps in the hiring of the next Bloomfield uh, Hills High School principal. Also, over the past few weeks, we held transition events for community members in all four of our elementary schools. Uh, we've welcomed hundreds of families uh, to tour elementary schools to learn about the exciting happenings that are going on as part of the transition. And hoping everyone in the community has a safe and relaxing long weekend. Thank you, Dr. Southward. Thank you. Moving on to item number uh, five, board president report. I'm going to uh, combine my report with the superintendent search. So the board of education met on uh, last week and we met with our search firm. And uh, this week our update is we we were able to send a survey out to our families. Um, the search firm also was able to meet with our students this past week, which is amazing, our student interns. There were six students that actually um, showed up to meet and discuss how we would actually um, get our students in the high school and middle school to participate. Um, from there, they determined that they would use a few of the student leadership groups um, to uh, converse and um, participate as like this in a similar format as our uh, community to participate in the same three questions that were uh, in the survey that our families have access to on our website. From there, our high school students met yesterday, as well as our administrators at the high school. Our IA students uh, also spoke uh, with uh, the search firm, which is amazing. And as well as some of our staff members that were invited to participate, um, we did have some low attendance at some of these events. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, and then there was also a uh, 6 p.m. community member um, uh, session as well. From there, our search firm has also updated our uh, work with our community uh, communications group and with our communications um, team. Our website has been updated to provide you with up-to-date information on our superintendent search. Uh, we are looking to, um, from, the, from the information gathered from our s survey, we're going to be putting together our candidate profile and as well as a position announcement. Our search firm will be sending us um, documentation after the conclusion of our final community, community uh, meeting on Wednesday. From there, we'll be looking for feedback from our uh, board of education um, immediately. So it'll be like a fast turnaround team uh, that Thursday. Our goal is to try to stay on, on our timeline and having the position posted by June 1st. At the same time, we are um, also working with our search firm uh, in, in, in parallel in looking at uh, our possible interim. And so what he is doing is having some initial, initial talks with a few folks um, regarding some possible um, candidates for that particular position as well. Any questions? Um, in the audience, uh, Maybe be a little quieter when you're whispering. Thanks. <laughs> uh, no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was kind of that was kind of hard to talk over. <laughs> All right. So, any anything else regarding the superintendent search? No. So we'll move on to item number seven, which is our healing response plan from our superintendent. Thank you, Dr. Southward. Um, there's been no additional incident, incidents of hate that have been reported. Uh, communication camp update, well, we've secured the dates for staff training in September and the camp dates in November. 
Um, during the summer, there will be planning meetings that take place to discuss the timeline and process for notifying the students. They'll be going to communication camp. Uh, part of the communication camp will be a comprehensive program focused on civil discourse and critical dialogue facilitated by trained BHHS faculty. Also going along with the action items, um, identify and review research-based approaches to further develop a positive school culture and climate. Uh, the government teachers are planning a Washington, D.C. trip for the spring of 2024 for junior students. This is to make up for the fact that they missed their eighth grade D.C. trip due to COVID. Uh, turn back over to you, Dr. Southward. Thank you. We're going to move on to item number eight, Diversity Assembly Investigation Committee update. Trustee Van Gimmeret or uh, Trustee Hill? Sure. Um, we met with... Uh, the uh, attorney last week, was it, Megan? Yes, last week. Yeah. Um, last uh, they advised us that a report will be ready on June 2 for the committee to review and um, the following week for the board to review. And then I believe we're going to try to get it on the June 8th agenda. That would likely be closed because there may be uh, employee names or things that, you know, maybe sh shouldn't be disclosed, but uh, I don't know for sure. Uh, Rebecca's not here, and she indicated that the June 8th meeting was pretty packed, so, um, but I, it's my suggestion, I think the committee's suggestion to just squeeze it in because we, you know, it's something we need to do as urgently as possible. So that's what we got so far. And the goal will be to share as much of the report as possible without compromising personnel issues. Right. Okay, so we'll try to figure out that's gonna be at the beginning or the end of the meeting. Okay, any questions? All right, thank you. Moving on to item number nine, which is a consent agenda, Trustee Van Gimmeret. Man, I need to get some readers. Um, <laughs> I move. I move that the Board of Education approve the recommendations detailed in the consent agenda as follows: request to approve the minutes from the study session of April 13, 2023; request to approve the minutes from the regular meeting of April 27, 2023; request to approve the minutes from the special meeting of May 2, 2023; request to approve the minutes from the study session of May 11, 2023. Request to approve the minutes from the special meeting of May 17, 2023. I move that the Board of Education approve the financial reports as presented by Karen Hildebrand. I move that the Board of Education approve the disbursement, the disbursement reports as presented by Karen Hildebrand, Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations. I move that the Board of Education approve the food service management contract renewal with Aramark Education Services, LLC, to provide food services management for the 2023-24 fiscal year, as presented by Karen Hildebrand. And I move that the Board of Education approve the personnel actions as presented by Keith McDonald, Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources. Consent agenda has been properly moved. Is there a second? Second. Here in a second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Well, wait. Sorry, any discussion? Okay. No. All those in favor? Any, any opposed? Seven zero. Moving on to item number 10, general discussion, 10A, transportation center location. Good. Press, Can I go uh, ahead? Superintendent Watson. Thank you, Dr. Southward. Uh, so we did send an email out to the East Hills and East Over community uh, yesterday, letting them know that where the ball fields are located and baseball and soccer, that that area is no longer an area for consideration. As far as where we can actually put the transportation center and what options exist, uh, we'll be working with a small group that's part of the bond committee that includes three board members, looking at what options are available and what might meet the needs of the community. And once we have some additional thoughts and vetted some additional ideas, we'll bring that back to the whole group. But we'll be working with that small group on that and of course, with Bartomeu, Plant, Mariah, and Cressa, and then internal administrators as well. For those of you who don't know, our board um, bond committee consists of Trustee Van Gimmeret, um, Trustee um, Kumar, and uh, Trustee Coleman. Correct. So that's the only update as of now. 
Any other comment? Um, I do want to clarify um, the email that went out, I think it was yesterday. We got, we received that email 30 minutes beforehand. Um, I worked up an edit to that email. Um, I didn't realize when the email was going to be sent. And, and this is what I would have had the email say. Um, the administration presented a number of options uh, for the location of the transportation center to the Board of Education at the June 9, 2022 and July 21st, 22 study sessions, including uh, the administration's recommendations. As part of that discussion, administration outlined next steps, which included establishing user group meetings, completing surveys, geotechnical services, et cetera, conducting noise and traffic studies, generate a, generating a budget, and conducting information meetings with surrounding neighborhoods and communities. Following that process, the, the administration was to seek BOE appro approval. So prior, there's been no approval for a transportation center before, and, and there hasn't been one now. We, we don't know where we're going to put it. Um, while the process of inquiry is just beginning, we have heard your, or, and then it goes on to say, we've heard your feedback and the fields are off the table. So I guess I just wanna clarify that while we were presented with that option, there were a number of other things that were to take place um, to determine whether or not that was a viable option. And since that time, nothing has happened. And, and finding out that a survey happened was something that we found out at the same time as you found out, or shortly thereafter, I guess. No, I mean, oh, I, echo, just, I, yeah, no, I, I echo that. I mean, I, when I read what you wrote, I agree with that. Um, you know, we talked, other people said the same thing. When we got elected, we made promises. We made a lot of promises, and um, key to that is transparency. To, so to be transparent and clear, you know, I certainly wasn't baking anything in the background. I don't think anybody was trying to do that, I think. As, as I found out, you know, I, I'm sure I had the same uh, reaction other people had about what might have been, you know, thought about, about transportation, what's happening. And to be clear, you know, we have the same concern. I, I'll just say, speak for myself, I have the same concerns. I want to make sure that when we promise something, we deliver on a promise. Um, you know, we advocated and worked with the community members who supported that bond. And I think that's always the goal, at least I have in my mind, is whatever we promised, we should try to strive for that. Um, you know, that's our best effort. Things can change and things have changed. I mean, that's why we have change orders with all these bond projects, but we need to be transparent, we need to communicate. I think now is the time, this is a, a great opportunity to pick that back up, no matter how this ends up, but we communicate with the community frequently as much as possible surveys um, so I'm not in the in the committee necessarily but very eager to stay in tune with that if we need to go out and visit with people at sites if we need to talk um, I will always be ready for that because I think this is something obviously we've heard loud and clear um, that we need to work very closely with them and and I will be happy to do that but um, to the rest of the community that's here that's listening we hear you um, you know I just want to be clear that as John said, you know, there wasn't something, there wasn't a plan certainly that we were working on and doing anything. Um, so we hear you and we wanna work with you. This is not something that we're trying to do uh, unilaterally. So uh, we support you in that regard. And, and at least from my perspective, our goal is always to deliver on whatever our promise was originally and to strive for that. And when changes happen, we communicate with you and make sure that you're a part of that process. So we will, we look forward to um, our committee um, reporting back on those discussions at each meeting. Is that okay? Our first report. Our first report would be probably in June. Yeah, at the June Committee of the Whole. Not so much in the Transportation Center, but an update on the bond in general will be yeah. reviewing Okay. That. 
I think from a committee perspective, we, we are working closely with administration, Plant Moran, and Barton Mallow to make sure that everything that we promised in the bond is delivered on time and as much as we can at this point on budget. Okay. Thank you for that. We look forward to your committee report and keeping us um, in the loop as to how these discussions pan out so we can have this larger talk at the board table. Thank you so much. Item 10B, Wing Lake Playground Equipment Discussion. So on the morning of April 19th of uh, this year, we received an email with an invite to a fundraiser. Um, I was writing an email about something else and I, I asked the question, why does Wing Lake have to fundraise for a playground? Um, uh, Trustee Colin responded, my suggestion to pay for the playground with the $400,000. Um, and that's how this agenda item got here today because we, we're not sure exactly what is going on and, and why we might, what, like, if we can do yeah. that. You know, I, so. I think we had a discussion at our last study session right. about $400,000 being transferred from the center fund to the general fund to pay for seven year old legal fees from our special education department which I adamantly opposed to doing. Then, to John's point, you know, one of the questions that came up in the study session is, why aren't we using it for Wing Lake? And apparently, I, I guess we were under the impression that they didn't need anything, and then we resurfaced this playground equipment. So my question is, why can't we use this money, which is 400000 to pay for the playground equipment? And that's why it's on the agenda. Um, I'm sorry. And I guess, well, I guess I'll follow up and I'll, I'll ask a question for Karen. Can we legally pay for this playground equipment from the center funds? Or, or, it can be used for whatever is the pleasure of the board. Okay, so I would make a recommendation that we use this money to pay for this playground equipment so they do not have to fundraise for it. I think we just need to take a five minute recess. Yes. yes. Okay. Can we? Yeah. Uh, can we take a, we're gonna take yeah, a five minute. Um, take a five minute adjournment. No can somebody make a, thank, uh, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. We'll take a five minute recess. Thank you unwell and had to head home. Um, so I'll be uh, continuing for the, and sharing the rest of the meeting. So we left off an item 10 a, 10B, yep. Wing Lake Playground Equipment Discussion. Yeah, so I guess the question is, we have this, we have excess funds, there's a need, there's the playground need, yeah, that's the immediate need, and there may be other needs um, that we can go through. And apparently, legally, we can use it. It's unrestricted. So can we, as a board, instruct administration to, that we agree and it should be paid for? Um, yeah, I mean, I have some Do we want to go around the room? <clears throat> I have a couple quick things to add. Um, so I know last study session we talked about uh, like PTO fundraising because we got John mentioned we got that email and it was like well, why are they, you know why are they doing that <clears throat> and there was discussion about well typically a lot of times the PTOs do raise money for playground equipment but this is a very different situation in my mind um, you know you have as the community talked about you have students from all over the place it's not just Bloomfield Hills you have students that have very very unique special um, customized needs that, you know, the costs are huge. We're not talking about a Conant raising money for a playground. Um, it's apples to oranges. Um, so, you know, and we're talking about students that may exist in group homes and things like that. So talking about fundraising is just such a different, a different notion than when we talk about it at, our, at our, you know, elementary schools or anything like that. So, you know, I looked into it. I know we had a discussion or we had a, a question about 
how it was funded in the past, and I know that there was, you know, Kellogg Foundation, I think, was one of the ways that it had been funded. We were unable to use that once it flipped to going um, from public use to not public use. I happened to reach out to Kellogg just to ask. It's not, it, it, they typically say now, they typically don't support that. But I think we have to find a way, whether it's, um, obviously I, I would support transferring that, but I think there's a number of other things we can look at too. Uh, I would add that special education on the state's budget, which we should know very soon, has a large increase in special education funding as well as going up to 100% of the dollars rather than um, the lower percentages it was in the past. So I think I agree with Paul. We can do it. We should stop transfers and we should reverse and put that money back to where we can have a, a larger impact with it. Okay. Thank so. you, um, I echo what he says, and I and I um, want to make a comment about the last meeting and some comments that I know that I probably made during the meeting. I know that as a board member, I'm not going to get all of this perfect. I'm going to say things I regret, and I know that one of the the, the comments that I made, uh, not even flippantly, but uh, without being more measured and informed, was something to the effect of, "I was there at Wing Lake, and I had a conversation, and it sounds like they have what they need," and that was probably one of the worst things I've said out loud publicly at a board meeting is making that comment. So I apologize for that. Um, this is clearly very layered and very complex and there's a lot for us to understand. And so um, I'm, in, I'm in support of or funneling those dollars for that purpose as much as we can. It sounds like there's even broader range of issues and needs that are there. Um, I am the Wing Lake liaison and I would like to commit more time to being there and understanding all the needs in and out so that when I am here at the board table, I'm making representations that are accurate. Thank you, Trustee Hill. Trustee Van Gummer. I asked the question only because I'd been a part of a, an Eastover fundraising for playground equipment, and then when the bond came around, all of a sudden, every elementary school is getting playground equipment, and I thought, why are we still fundraising for playground equipment? And I, I had just got a flyer, you know, an email from from saying, hey, can you come out to this event? And I, I thought it was odd, you know, that one school is not getting a playground but all the other schools are. So yes. that's all, I, I mean, I, I, I'm for using the funds. I, I don't know accounting wise how it would work. And I don't know that, I don't know what this motion is saying exactly accounting wise, but um, I support the, the notion. It, yeah, I think with this, um, we just need to see a summary of scope of work. I don't think that we're signing off on it at this moment, yeah. but we're expressing, excuse me, expressing support for it. Mm -hmm. and would like to see the details and, and the projected costs and the breakdown and all that, but I think we are in support. So there's two elements to this, right? One is the transfer of funds. I think I'm hearing everybody say we're in support of not transferring those, so we're pulling that back, right? I don't know. Or, or that action. So let's go around the table, Cole, but, but I heard at least from right. three of you, right? Um, and I'm in favor of that as well. I think I'm better educated now than I was uh, the last session. Um, so let's get that piece out, and then we'll come back to the funding for the playground itself. Um, yeah, with regard to that, I'm I don't know what I said at the study session necessarily. To me, the study session is a time for learning and, and figuring things out and, and mm -hmm. discussion. So, I, Trustee Hill, I don't fault you for <laughs> saying things. So, you know, Not we're, be the last. It, it's a discussion, a, more of a time for discussion and learning and, and figuring things out. And so, I, I don't remember what I said, um, but um, I think I kind of wavered back and forth. They said, Paul's right, but you know, blah, 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 you know, but this is how we did it. And you know, and I was kind of on the fence, um, but I agree. Um, there's- So specific to the general trans, I mean, yeah, trans- Yeah, so we, but I, like I said, I also don't really know exactly how that works out on an accounting level. I, I don't know that we've actually transferred the funds yet. <laughs> no, I don't <laughs> that, I think not. that's what was said last time. Uh, yeah. So. Well, well, I think we're voting on the budget tonight. I, yeah. And so we would have to, stipulate in the budget if we are voting that that money would say not be transferred, not be transferred right mm -hmm. so to, to civis point two things right stipulating that money not be transferred and then obviously working with rebecca from that building um 
and and the PTO over that building to see, you know, right, step two is what is the cost that, that is needed to fund this, and then maybe there are other things that we've heard to fund, and we could use that money or mark that money toward that. Um, my understanding of this whole situation is that we are un underfunded in special education, and that's why they needed to use this um, accounting practice, and it doesn't look good to so many people, and I'm trying to understand it more Did right now. Um, I, I didn't I didn't understand it last time. It's seven years of legal fees that's already been paid, mm -hmm. and now we're transferring $400,000 to cover it because we were in a budget deficit. So as I said at the last meeting, it's, you know, it's whatever, some accounting, creative accounting, which I was not comfortable with, and I was not gonna vote on the budget tonight um, because of that. And then obviously when we found out that there's money to be needed, so even more so that that money should be used for the people of Wing Lake. Just a point of clarification, the only vote on the budget tonight is on the Oakland Schools budget, not Bloomfield Hill Schools. Thank you. So we, right. do we need to prepare a motion to say, hey, at so, least at this point we're committed to not transfer. finishing the transfer from right. center out, or however that's set up, but going reverse. You don't need a motion. I don't know. I, I think we're in general agreement that okay. the funds are not going to be used. Yeah. Uh, from the special education okay. fund Correct. to the general. Good. Yeah, and Noted. to John's point, the purpose of the study sessions is to be able to have open dialogue. We, mm. we can't, as a board, sit and have these discussions and which take an, a, a large amount of time to understand these issues in and out. So we're sometimes learning about things that in a perfect world we'd know everything, but some, sometimes from a practical standpoint we can't. And <clears throat> we want to support our community and, wh and the, what their needs are, but I also want to show a lot of support for our staff and the hard job that they do and that they're accustomed to things that then it comes out and it might seem, it might appear a way that wasn't intended. And I want to have their back as well and make sure that we're hearing their side of why they're doing things the way they do and give them a chance, a fair chance, and not assume um, ill intent, but hear them out, learn the process, make sure I have a fully informed decision before I, I take a strong stance on it. So it's a balance of, of representing both the community, but also making sure that we have staff that enjoys working with us, knows that we um, want to understand their roles inside and out, and that uh, we want to work with them. That's My it. question Thank is, you. how are the, the $400 paid for then, or 400, 400,000? <laughs> Um, because so, it, it's all one district, right? And you know, you rob Peter to pay for Paul, or Paul. You, I, I, I don't. Mean, I don't look I'm, at so it. So my that. question is just, where it, do we go from here with that? It, my, my my suggestion is, we clearly hear the Wing Lake community voice that they'd like us to fund the playground. How about we? take some time to study the, the needs at Wing Lake and also look at it um, from a perspective of other playgrounds, what's been committed so far, what's left to be spent, what more is there at other playgrounds to be spent, get a better assessment of everybody's need. I'm not sure I know it all. all right. uh, Superintendent Watson, yes. is it possible um, to, uh, we did get an email with kind of some detail about what they thought it was going to cost. Um, is it possible by um, <laughs> a meeting or two down the road um, that we have a motion put on that says we're going to fund X amount of dollars or up to X amount of dollars and that the district helps Wing Lake figure out how to get this playground? Is, is that something that, that we could like? Not sure I understand the complete request, sorry. So we got an email f saying that th it's a two-phase project. Uh, I think 150 grand out of the gate and then some additional sunshades that were another 50 grand. I, I don't know, it seemed like it was about $200,000 project. Um, can that be paid for just directly out of the center fund? 
it, so with disregarding the, the $400,000 transfer from the center fund to the general fund, can we just pay for the playground out of the center fund and not have to do any I believe accounting? so. Yeah, Karen, correct me yeah. if I'm wrong, but I believe so. Can, can you? So there, there's two options that are available that we can do. Number one, we can have the playground equipment charge as capital equipment directly to the center program fund okay. as we incur the expenses, or the board could authorize the transfer out of the center program fund into the capital equipment fund have the capital equipment fund pay for that so it's capitalized with the rest of our fixed assets. That would really be the cleanest way to do that. And I think the PowerPoint, John, that you're referencing had phase one at like 155,000 and phase two was 70,000. So what I might recommend is that the next, on the next board agenda, perhaps consider funding up to $250,000 transfer based on the scope of work for the Wing Lake Playground and to transfer it into the capital equipment fund. And obviously this would not happen by June 30th, so it'd be fiscal year 24 budget. And then to remove the legal fee transfer that had been originally approved and budgeted to keep that within the center program reserves. I think that's the two step process. I think that makes yeah, that sounds reasonable. That makes okay. total sense. Any that's other fine. comment? No. Item for discussion? Seems equitable to me to have their equipment covered, okay. like you were saying. So Ben Watts, any comments or questions? Yes. Yeah. You know, All right. All right. We'll continue making progress on that. Thank you. All right. General discussion complete on item 10B. We will move on to 10C, catchment areas discussion. Now, this is something I've been on the fringe of, so I can't. Something you what? I've been on the fringe of this discussion, oh. and I know this handout just came out. But yeah. um, um, I know Michelle was more involved in that. Michelle was a little bit more involved. Um, I essentially, give a, I can give a high level. You want to go? Yeah, okay. So I can give a high level. So, so the, the, this this goes back to, you know, obviously the the whole. Um, realigning areas right to balance the four elementary schools and the school that ultimately because of factors that it impacted was was way way elementary where they realigned um, so step one is they realigned and then my understanding and anyone could correct you know superintendent Watson correct me is there were X amount of families that were designated to eventually go to Conant because of the realignment. So uh, so I guess a communication happened and then X and then what it was is so they said that you could either stay away without busing or go to Conan, but you're gonna have to go to South. And so a lot of families left and some families decided to stay away. Then after I think seeing how the numbers are shaking out, and I think at the time, you know, originally it was thought that North was gonna have higher numbers than South. It started to shake out that South was having, was more populated than North. A decision was made that since the people are at way, with it still without busing, who are, who are scheduled to go to Cal, you could go to middle school North. So that was like, you know, like, I guess whatever it was, let's just say eight months later, an exception was made for that to go to middle school north. And so that's kind of where we are. And then so there's a segment of the population, like the people who went to Conant and never had that option because they're now scheduled to go to south to go to north. And then there's a segment that has always been zoned for way to go to north because a lot of their cohorts are in South, going, are at Conan going to South, would now like potentially, I'm not saying it's a lot, there's some families that would like to go to South. That's kind of where we are. So we started by passing the bond in August of 2020. And regardless of the bond had passed or not, we committed to redoing the catchment areas so we could better balance uh, and right size the school district. So we are closing three middle schools and we are opening two brand new middle schools. Um, when the decision was made to go with two middle schools instead of one, then we needed to establish feeder patterns. So the next two feeder patterns, or the feeder patterns established, 
where Conant and Lone Pine would go to South Hills Middle School, and then you would have Way in Eastover that would go to North Hills Middle School. And then we looked to see what those numbers might look like. After that, the next step was looking at whether or not we could have a legacy option for our elementary students because we know some were moved Conant to Lone Pine, Way to Lone Pine, East over to Way, Way to Conant, and then East Hills back to Way. And so we were able, based on the numbers, to offer an elementary legacy. Within that, we looked at each elementary building within their cohorts, trying to keep them together by moving students from Way to Conant and moving students from Way to Lone Pine if they were to accept uh, or use the legacy option to stay at Way, yes, they would have to provide their own transportation, but because they were going way to Conan and way to Lone Pine, they then were supposed to go to South Hills Middle School. So for those two groups, and it equates to three subdivisions, we extended the elementary legacy so that they had the option to go to North with the other students that are at Way. For example, if you uh, this year um, had a first grader at Way Elementary School and you were reassigned to Conant, but you decided you wanted to stay at Way, you'd be there for second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. Had we not extended that elementary legacy for middle school, that fifth grader then will go to South Hills Middle School instead of having the opportunity to go to North with all the people they had been in the building with. So, in fact, they do have an option to go either to South or to North, um, whereas if you're at Conant, everyone at Conant, if they were moved, they stayed South. If you were at, um, if you were at Eastover and you were moved away, you were still going North, regardless. So, if you had a kindergartner at Eastover, you were redistricts the way, you decided you wanted to go to the way early, you were still going North with everyone else. If you had a kindergarten at East Over, you decided you want to stay, use the legacy option, and not get transportation, you were still going north. And so that's why that was made. We only communicated that to the families that were impacted in those three subdivisions. We did not communicate it overall to the community. Was well, just a question. So originally, the, the group that was at Way, that originally it was you could stay at Way without busing, but was it indicated to those families originally, not the, the, the second sort of exception, was that even if you stay at Way, you would, you would have to go to South, the original plan of the, when you had the legacy. Was that the original plan? That even if you were at Way, you'd have to go to South. So that's why a lot of families decided to go to Conant. Well, from Way to Conant, there are 27 students that got redistricted. 19 students stayed at Way, eight students moved to Conant, and that's based on the data from 12, 19, 22. And at that time, we didn't have, there was not a middle school legacy option that was available. If there, of those students that went to Conant, if they went early because they felt, you know what, we don't know whether there will or won't be, we'll just go and then we'll go south. Because they were originally away and they were part of the legacy, if they would prefer to go north because they're part of that three subdivision group, we would honor that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Got it. Okay. Any questions so, from the board? Yeah, I think the question is that there's a potentially a group of students who are at way. That want that, that, that way that want to because their 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 cohorts or right, whatever the, their are, are, are now going to Conant via South would like right. to go to South. So I guess the question is: Is it possible, from a numbers point of view, without busing for those students that are zoned for North to go to South? So I want to make sure I'm getting the question correct. You're asking. Is it possible for all students who currently attend Way to have the option to go to North or South? Correct. It would depend on how many, it would depend on class size, it would depend on staffing, and then, you know, we'd also want to hear from the board, is that same option available for students who don't attend Way? 
So can our East Over students have the same option to go north or south? Can our Lone Pine students have the same option to go north or south? Because when I think of cohort and we talk about cohort internally, we're talking about each elementary building. How do we keep and travel the elementary building students together? So if they're, you know, at one point way in Conant fed into Bloomfield Hills Middle School. Right, but we're talking like, about students who are at way who have not been redistricted. Who have not been redistricted, but, but their, would like their to go south. friends got redistricted to Conant who are going to south. Okay. And so these people, these children who have their friends that are going to go to South and they're at Way want to go to South. I don't know if it's feasible. That's the question that I have is what's the number, what do the numbers look like? This is a unique situation. We're not talking about Eastover kids going to South because they're all in this catchment area. They've always been in this catchment area. We're not talking about Lone Pine students, they're in this, you know, they all, all the kids will eventually make it to South Hills. All the Conan kids will eventually make it to South Hills, but all the current Way students, some of them will go to North and some of them will go to South. And the question is for those students, not in the future, the students that exist right now. For all the current Way students, can they all have the choice? No, not, can they all have the, I mean, you I have guess to do potentially, it that way. but because they all can have friends that go to South. Right, so is there, could there be a process where, I mean, no, I mean could I mean, there be a process right. that's, that's the where, question. And can we serve? Where, where, where we identify whether or not it's possible? That's all I'm asking. So the process we had in place was we had inter-district transfer options, right? That was something we had in place that we shut during COVID as we looked to right size. We could take a look at potentially offering that earlier than we had proposed, which was not until next year. And that will require a parent to fill out a form and say, hey, I've got a third grader, uh, I'll be at Lone Pine, but we really, really want to go to Eastover next year instead. And then it would depend on whether or not there would be room available. And then if there's room available, then that opportunity would be granted. That's what we did traditionally as a district. And it always depended on whether or not there was room. Um, doing it this late in the year, we probably wouldn't have an answer if we did that until late August. Um, families come in all summer yeah, long, uh, and typically uh, when families move, you don't know they move until a request comes in for their CA-60, then you see that they moved and want to be very cognizant of balancing elementary size classrooms guess, as well. What, I guess what the question is about middle, middle school, school, and I guess the question is, there's two questions. One, whether or not you could hold the student but I know obviously the goal is to balance the building. So if you're just saying, can we hold the student? Just what do you mean hold? Like, you, you, I mean, you're saying if there's room, you know, the goal was to balance the middle schools to be even, but is, is the question just that, whether there's room in that building? When, when is, is the question is, can South hold X amount of students, X amount of more students? Or how many students can South hold and how many students are enrolled now? Um, 750, I believe, is what each school can hold. And then it comes not so much to capacity, it comes down to staffing, right? You don't, what we have now, where you might have one building, I'll give you an example, uh, where you could have 32 kids in an eighth grade algebra class in one building, and this is a lived experience, and 16 in another building. The parents were happy with the 16, obviously not happy with the 32. But the inter-district transfer would allow for that as well. It would allow if there is room within a grade level for that transfer to take place. Um, you wouldn't do a one-to-one -one swap because you would want to know what the class sizes are. If sixth grade is larger uh, in one building compared to the other by seven students, you wouldn't just want to do a one-to-one -one swap because you want to lower the class size in the other cohort in the other building. And it also comes down to scheduling especially with electives. So a one-to-one -one swap typically doesn't work. Um, that's a lived experience as well. That's so. Like, is, the, is the question is, are, are, are you willing to look at the options for inter-district transfers at this point? Like yeah, I can, take that, I can take that back to the team and see what might be feasible for this year. Uh, I believe you're asking K through eight, correct? Well. Uh, Six through eight, right? Six through eight. Yeah. No, that's the problem. Before it was available for elementary and middle, I we we we've had requests 
for interdistrict transfers for north and south and for all the elementary buildings. So all those requests have come in during the catchment period. So, so you're saying you're not going to limit it to just the, I'm, getting to John's point, the, right. the people that were impacted from neighborhoods that were moved, you're saying the only way you would do it would open it up to K through eight throughout the district as opposed to that limited scope. Three subs. The three subs, yeah. The, the three subs already have that option. So the families that moved from Way to Conant and Wayne to Little Pine, that move took them from North Hills to South Hills for their catchment area. So everyone's been impacted. And the impact has been felt differently by different people based on their priorities. So everyone, every, every group of students that goes to school is going with a new group next year. Yes, all these stores are staying together. But no longer are you placing your child in a kindergarten classroom in K through eight, it's the same group of students with a little change. Now they're having the students from Wakeman. So every group is changed. And if there's room, there's room, right? So if we're trying to give everyone the opportunity to move if they'd like to move, then it would be better to look at it from a K through eight point to see where there may or may not be room. <coughs> Maybe there's a first grade student that wants to move. I mean, that would be equitable, wouldn't it, to allow that? To provide everyone to have the same opportunity. No, I think equity is looking at the impacted students. Equality is looking at all students. So what we're saying, what, what, what I'm saying is there are however many students at, who are scheduled to go to North Hills either next year or into the future, okay, whose friends, I'm told, are going to Conant and then scheduled to go to South Hills. Right. I don't know how, like, and all I'm asking is, can we inquire how many, how many people, like, do, do we have to do the transfer option or can we just put out an inquiry? We find out if, if it's 10 families, then can't we just, like, handle that, you know, as, as we've handled it for the students who got, who were going to go to South, but are now being allowed to go to North. So, are you referring to surveying the current fifth grade class of parents who are at Way and saying, you've got a fifth grader at Way. You're supposed to go North. However, would you like to go South? Or are you thinking surveying a fourth third or all way parents and ask them in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, hey, by the time you get to middle school, do you want to go south? Yes, we can survey and get that information. I just need to know the grade band you're thinking of, whether it's K through five or just fifth grade because they would be in middle school next year. I mean, I'm not, I don't know, to be honest. So. What would cost the least disruption to the district? That's the other side of it, right? You throw the floodgates wide open, you're causing, could potentially cause chaos. So if you allow everyone to, uh, to pick the middle school, it will be chaos. Uh, again, lived experience, schools become unbalanced and things like that. The other option is looking at doing the interdistrict transfer. Those are only granted if there's space available. And again, if you're going to an area that's not your catchment area, then you need to provide your own transportation. But this would allow if you've got a third grade class of 22 in one building and 17 in the other building and someone from that 22 wants to go down to be with the group that has the 17, well, that's great. Now we're at 21, 18. That's a good switch. We wouldn't say for that person, you've got your cohort is or your class size is 17 average and third grade opponent and you want to go to Eastover and their average class size is 23. Well, we're not going to move that person. It doesn't make sense because you're just increasing that class size. That's probably the easiest, but happy to send out a survey, whatever grade band, maybe it's just fifth grade, because it, as a former mm -hmm. elementary parent, it's kind of hard to think that far down the road what you may want or not want, but we could survey all the way fifth grade parents and say, hey, if you had the opportunity to go to South Hills Middle School, would you go? Yes or no? 
get that data and provide that data back to the board for further discussion, we could easily do that. And I'm guessing that would just be for way. We wouldn't offer the opportunity for Conant or any of the other elementary buildings to weigh in if they wanted to go someplace else either, correct? Sure, I mean, I'm really just voicing, you know, what I heard at the tail end of a meeting that I went to, and, and I, I think that voice needs to be heard. And so I don't, I mean, do I have an opinion? Yes, but is my opinion the only opinion? Obviously not, you know, so I, I'm really just articulating what was told to me and I think it's a valid point, but I'm not the, the voice, you know. We're not this. We're not having. Yeah, hold on, sorry, guys. We're not having public you, comment. Uh, we and I know I've gotten some of the emails. I promise we've looked at it. And if there's more, please send it. But we can't. We can't have a two-way dialogue. I, I, we can't have a two-way dialogue right now. I'm sorry. If you have public comment, that's the place to do it. Catch me after. Catch any of us after, but not in the meeting. Please. Thank you. Sir, please. Guys, guys, we listen, we got to have decorum, please. I'm asking for I'm asking for you to just stop. Please. Okay. It's not a back and forth. We just can't do it We can not I'd love to do it. But it's not how we can do it. So, why, thanks guys. Why don't I provide some additional data? Let's do this. We'll use one data point to start. That data point will be fifth grade, fifth graders who are currently at way. We can send out a survey and say, if you had the opportunity to go south, would you want to go south? That will at least give us another data point to kind of look at that. We can review numbers again, and then we can also, uh, within the administration, talk about what it might look like offering the interdistrict transfer earlier than we had planned to. The goal was to get everyone in their new catchment, get everyone in their new seats, kind of see where we're at, staff properly, make sure we have all our electives, but we can look at that as well. Uh, but that at least will give you two additional data points. So I could do that. Uh, I can work with the communications team and um, kind of go from there, at least give you some additional data points. I think that's good. <clears throat> Otherwise, we're, we're just guessing randomly. If we open something up, you don't know what's gonna happen. And I, like, we know it's specific areas. It's not like we have to guess. We kind of have a good feeling, but we do need to know numbers because oh, yes, it's yes, May yes, 25th. Yes, but no. We're literally about to start school very soon here with all kinds of other things happening. So we should be able to identify pretty closely and have a sense for numbers, and yes, those two data points would help. Um, but to be fair, Trustee Fala, yeah, we've heard from multiple community members that would like to go to different buildings, right? I talked to a parent earlier this week, and her son just made friends through playing on a rec baseball team. Right. And no longer would like to attend Eastover um, and you know, would like to be able to go to South where the new friends on the team are as well. So keep that in mind. And the only reason that it was extended for the way to Conant and way to Lone Pine for that group was because they, by moving them from way to Conant and way to Lone Pine, they no longer could go with the students that are in their building that are slated to go to North Hills. Right. Do they, are they, they are, I mean, when you say extended, right, they're all aware that they have the choice? Yes, okay. so those families were directly communicated with. Okay. The community at large was not. Uh, no different than when you were a student transferred from, from Kona to Lone Pine, we communicated directly to those parent and those parent groups that were part of it. All right, so next steps, you're gonna come back. Yep, I'll work with the communications team. We'll survey the fifth grade uh, uh, parents only at way and kind of get some feedback with that. Then internally, we'll look at you know, what it might look like offering the inter-district transfer, which is something the district we've done before. It's not something we haven't done. It's been closed, like I said, since 2020 because of COVID and trying to get everyone into the seats, trying to balance class sizes, trying to balance staff, and then make sure we have everything set for our students that way. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pat. All right, moving on from item 10C to uh, board business, uh, 11A, request to approve cooperative agreement between Bloomfield Schools and the Charter Township of West Bloomfield Parks and Recreation Commission. 
Do you want to Is anyone going to speak? Or I guess. I, yeah, I, no, I mean, I think we make the motion and we speak, right? So I move the Board of Education to approve the cooperative agreement between the Bloomfield Hill Schools, Charter Township, and West Bloomfield Parks and Recreation Commission as presented. Second. Pat. Second uh, from John. Any discussion? Well, I think Pat was going to speak. I uh, appreciate the board uh, working with WB Parks on this. Uh, this is a great opportunity to really enhance a park for all of our community members. Uh, some additional changes based on the study sessions were done. I want to bring the board's attention to those. One, under the purpose of agreement, uh, the commission and school district agree to meet not less than annually, and the commission agrees to update the school district as such regarding prior year's improvements and the commission's plans for future capital improvements to the property. So that will be a yearly thing that was added in. Uh, we talked about before the amenities that would be added. Um, as you know, they do a great job with the parks program. Um, it's also cost avoidance for us, roughly to sixty, seventy thousand dollars per year cost avoidance. We then can put back into our students, uh, not to mention uh, a phenomenal facility. The other change that was added uh, came under twelve, the Commission's General Liability Insurance. Um, it was added from time to time, and it is a reasonable request that the policy, as far as general liability insurance, will be reviewed to make sure. 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the road, the $5 million insurance is great now, 30 years from now it may not. It gives us the opportunity to go back and revisit this. Um, as a reminder to our community, um, we are not selling the property. It is a cooperative agreement. As a district, we own the property. There are mechanisms if we were ever to need it to build an elementary school or something that we could get it back. We are simply turning over the operation of the facility of Pine Lake to make it more of a park and adding the trails and pickleball courts and redoing the baseball diamond and fixing up the playground and adding Porta Johns and then WB Parks will go from there. So to the district, to us, there is again zero cost. There is simply cost avoidance of sixty, seventy thousand dollars per year that then goes back to educate students. So thank you. This has been, I believe, Trustee Cullen, three yeah, years is, worth of work, two years yeah, worth of work? two, three years worth of work, which the question irrelevant to this, and, and I know it's different because West Bloomfield has a rec department. Correct. Um, I guess my question is um, on the same light is w what is the next step on the Fox Hills? Like w what, what are we doing there outside of tearing down the building and leaving it as green space? Is there any been talks to Obviously, not the township because I don't think they're interested. Um, but in any develop, you know, any outside um, place. Yes, uh -huh. I've met with an outside person before. Um, I, I, I did not bring it forward to um, to the board for discussion. One thing that was crystal clear from the Fox Hills community was don't bring uh, a lot of traffic and additional people coming through the neighborhood. So the proposal that was brought to me was to put one of those huge bubble domes up. And the other proposal that was brought to me was by uh, someone I've known for a long time who said, hey, we're going to turf all those fields. We're going to make it all turf for soccer. And it sounds great, but then because they would give us the funds for the turf, they wanted to use it Monday through Friday from 5 to 10, and then 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Saturday and Sunday. To me, to bring that forward would not have been a good idea. Um, the community would have zero use of the fields that would be put there, and it would bring nothing but traffic into the neighborhood. What I think would be, I don't know if you're asking my opinion or not, uh, what I think would be best to put there from a recreation facility idea, and we would need to secure the funding, is to put a cloverleaf diamond there. So you'd have four fields. In the middle, you put gang bathrooms, concessions, and you'd have the ability to announce games. And that would be a great amenity to add to the community. It would support our BBL program, and it would be equivalent to what some of the top communities in the state have. And if you'd like to see pictures of those communities, happy to show you to. Uh, that would be my recommendation. We look for ways and seek ways to is, fund that. Is that like is that the next discussion to talk with the BBL you know, talk with the BBL to see there's a cooperative agreement that they could help arrange to do that? 
Uh, potentially, we have a, a great relationship with the BBL. Yeah. Uh, they've got phenomenal leaders. Uh, to say they're passionate about recreation and baseball, it would be an understatement. Uh, there definitely is a need for additional baseball fields. I know they hope to grow the program. And this would provide the opportunity to, even for like house leagues, to be able to host a tournament on that type of site would be great. And BBL serves the majority of our kids when it comes to baseball in the community. And it really could be a great baseball type park there. So, so that would probably be the next step to talk with them to see what solutions they could help bring. Potentially, uh, okay. um, there's some other third party vendors. I don't know if they do it any longer, but Dick Sporting Goods used to get involved. And then we get into some naming rights and things like that. There could be some potential there. Uh, okay. But nothing else has come of that as of yet. Um, but hopefully the board will approve this cooperative agreement so we can turn it over and they are, I know they're anxious to get going and improve the facility. Um, to me, it's a win-win. Yep, okay. Thank you. Um, I was pleased to see some of the suggested um, additions in here, so it was really great to see that. And um, right now, I, I don't have any questions other than I think it's a great thing for our district to have almost $70,000 uh, less. Per year. Yeah, to take care of that property. Thank you. So I don't have any questions. Mr. Cohen, any comments? No. I'm good. John? I'm good. Nothing. No, we're good. Are we uh, ready, ready to vote? vote? Yeah. Yeah. All right. You want to? Oh, you, no, the motion's been made and second. You just all right. Uh, all sorry. Those let, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion passes 6 0. Vice President Corkin. Can I just say one more thing? I want, I want to thank all of you. This has been a really, really uh, something that's been meaningful to me. I know for our community on the west side, this is something they've asked for and we're really anxious to see happen. I know there's been prior conversations yep. talking to Trustee Colon that go back over a decade. And so to see the board support this, uh, it really means a lot and it means a lot to that part of the community. So thank you for your support. Thank you, Superintendent. All right, next item, 11B, request to authorize purchase agreement at 3115 Franklin Road and appoint designee. Anybody okay. want to pass I, move? I move, well, I move the Board of Education proceed with legal preparation of purchase agreement for 3115 Franklin Road with conditions and contingencies providing the district the right to back out at any time. Additionally, to authorize the superintendent to designate Alan Jaros and Nature Center community members to engage in communication with seller and seller's agent. Second, anybody? Second. Discussion? This is merely the preparation, correct? Correct. All right. right. It does not bind us to purchase with district funds at all. Got it. When do we expect that it will be prepared or does that depend on how long? Alan's here. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Um, yeah, so I suppose merely the preparation, I guess I don't know the timeline we get back with Clark Hill and Rich Sun, Richard Sunquist and, and ask. Um, so I suppose the board wants to see it before it goes in front of the seller, I'm hearing, understanding? Yes. Okay. That would be, the, that would be my preference. And it would need to be brought back to a, a board meeting study session? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to hear from other board members if you don't think it's practical. Clearly, obviously we need to sign off on it, but. Uh, what did you have in mind in terms of the cadence of next steps? My recommendation is having Alan reach back out, secure the document, send it to the board for any feedback that might be needed or provided or, or what say you, and then move on from there. But to not have to wait for another study session, we're pretty, we're pretty booked, or a board meeting, we're, we're pretty booked, or in a board update, it'd be a standalone document that will come out once finished for people to review. And then it would be one-way communication back to myself and Alan with any comments. Yeah, it could be, we don't have to wait. It could be communicated, you know, and you can do it one done. way, right? That's fine. So we could send it around. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, as soon as it's done, we can send it. All right. All right. Great. Ready to go to vote? Ready to go to vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes 6-0. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan.
Uh, item 11C, request to award C2307 BP6.2 building site work, all elementary schools. Paul Wills, BHS owner's rep from Plant Moran. Anyone to pass the motion? Read the motion. I move the Board of Education to award elementary school building site work to Michigan Recreational Construction in the amount of $674,810 plus a 10% contingency of $67,481 for a grand total of $742,291. We have a second? Second. Any comment, feedback? Paul? Just say it. I don't, no, I don't. I don't. I, I know I have a lot of comments usually, but <laughs> not not now. We ready to move to a vote? Yeah. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? All right. Motion passes six zero. Moving on to item eleven D, request to award C two three zero eight BP. I guess stands for bid back seven. Early childhood renovations at the new Eastover. I presume that's the old East Halls. I move the Board of Education to approve renovation work for the future early childhood center located at 1101 Westview Road for a total of $3,267,621.50. This $486,300. $486,367.50 under the original bond budget for this project. Second. second. Did you second? Second. Oh, you were asking for a second? <laughs> yeah. I second. second. Any discussion? I guess the question is what, what, what caused it to be $486,000 under budget? Good evening, uh, board members. Uh, yes, so um, during the bond process, um, again, this is a series two project uh, that started design development uh, actually in November. Um, and so when we were going through it, uh, the, one of the biggest items is actually the mechanical systems. Um, so Jake McDermott and the mechanical contractors went through. The actual HVAC units are actually in decent shape to last probably for the next five to 10 years. We're also reutilizing the boilers um, from Fox Hills, which were put in a relatively newer. Um, that's the majority of that. And then also we're doing the partial roof and partial parking lots that are most critical. Uh, with those others kind of being looked at as one of those alternatives of looking at coming back towards the bond uh, once we're in that aspect of it. So that's for the most part why we're underneath that budget uh, that's currently being set in place. So we're, so we're using things that, so we're not replacing things, we're not replacing things new because, you know, Jacob and the engineers decide, you know, decided that what we have there is okay. Yeah, the useful life of most mechanical systems is about 25 years, and you're about the 15 to 17 year cycle right now. Um, so again, there is some useful life to that versus just replacing it today. Um, again, that's one of those items that we've kind of put on that potential infrastructure to look at as we come back uh, through series two and the series three. Uh, and then again, the boilers, I'm not sure of the exact age, but I know they're put in um, probably the last five years from sinking fund. Um, so again, those still have another 20 years of useful life for those boilers. So those are the two major components of the mechanical why it was under from that perspective. So, so everything in here, you're saying we won't have to fund for at least a minimum 10 years? Uh, I can't guarantee that something's gonna last you 10 years, but um, right now the useful life does show that it's just last you another 10 to 15 years on the mechanical side. Okay, all right. And again, we, we spent a lot of time on the blue sheets, again, looking at paving, the roofing, the security vestibule, which is key, um, looking at the classrooms, um, so the hallways and the corridors and the lights and the flooring will be done. Uh, there's new fire suppression, so again, taking a really hard look at that to make sure it was a critical need uh, from an infrastructure standpoint. So. Yeah, because I guess my question is, is that, right, in the bond, we've said all of these things would be new, and I guess an analysis done, 500,000 doesn't need to be new, and we wouldn't want and I'm, I'm assuming your analysis says we wouldn't want in like three, four years, well, we're gonna have to replace these boilers because we didn't get them new. Correct. Right? The other large component of that was the infrastructure, um, new electrical feed from the street. Again, there's um, tested through the voltage, there's no voltage drops that would necessitate a brand new feeder. So again, that's some of that due diligence that the team goes through, through the design process. So again, we kind of went line item by line item in the bond, making sure that would address the critical needs, educational needs, infrastructure, and then obviously community pieces for that. So. Okay. 
But yeah, those are the major components that, again, are resulting in being under budget by about 400,000. Okay, all right, as long as three years from now, it's you know, we need to replace boilers in the new state of the art you know, in our new in childhood. childhood center because we didn't get them new, and you're saying that's not going to be the case. That's correct. Okay. So, Paul, my question would be, so is an estimated 10-year life the threshold, so if we think it's got another 10 years, then we would consider reusing it elsewhere. Is that Correct. I mean, most boilers will last you 25 to 30 years. Um, again, routine maintenance is key, um, yearly check-ins, filters, replacements, things of that nature. Um, you should be able to get 25 to 30 years out of boilers and your ventilators. And so that was the decision from the professional team collectively presented through the administration team and ultimately to the board of don't replace a unit ventilator that's only eight or nine years old, wait that 10 to 15 years. Same thing with the boilers. You just put new boilers in at Fox Hills in the last five years, they're gonna last another 20 years. So let's reutilize those and go forward. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Any questions? No. no. Ready to vote on this? Sure. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes 6-0. Thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, next item, 11E, request to award EPDM roofing and metal panels for Conant Elementary New Media Center. I move the Board of Education award the Board of Education to award Conant's roofing to KJP Roofing and Sheet Metal Incorporated in the amount of $88,000 funded by the 202 bond fund and according to the change order request number 31, award Silver Line Contracting LLC for the metal panels $93,682.82 funded by Conant's construction contingency. Second. Any second? Discussion? This, this is what we talked about this Yeah, we discussed session. this we at the previous discussion. study session. This is something right. that you're saying in the, in the plans, in the previous plans, whatever, they were 1950, whatever, it couldn't have been detected? This was not a miss? No, so if you take a look, um, if you're familiar with Kona, this is the Mansart roof piece. So it used to be a gymnasium, it's getting converted to media center. When they started to take around the, the drywall and the interiors and started to take a look at the exteriors, there's actually mechanical, structural, electrical pieces that are actually not shown on the 1950s drawings. They were probably updated in the 70s or 80s, whenever that was renovated. Um, so this would be a true hidden condition. There's $88,000 in the bond program to cover a portion of that, and then obviously the rest would become uh, through our, the already approved contingency for the program. I'm, I'm saying in your, ex in your opinion, right, being our owner's rep, that mm -hmm. this was something that was, that, that was not a miss in the original bond. Yeah, so when the original bond was put, uh, work session was put together, there's no destructive or intrusive, um, I'll call it field testing, if mm -hmm. you will. It was done on visual, um, well, again, working with facilities, et cetera. So this would be a true uh, hidden condition from that perspective. And just for context, at the beginning of this project, in order to get up-to-date MEPs, in order to undertake that, it would have been obstructive. Well, I, how obstructive would it have been and what would the cost have been? Would that be standard practice with the age of our buildings? Can you shed some color sure. on that? Yeah, so to give you an idea, um, obviously the age of your buildings are all pre-1980s, so you have a lot of asbestos and leads, so you'd have to first do the environmental abatement of those materials before you could actually get into the walls. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we found this, you know, shortly after we started tearing into the walls after the abatement. Um, to give you an idea, about $800,000 has been spent today just on environmental abatement for the schools that are in construction, so I think to answer your um, question, Trustee Hill, is you probably spent upwards of millions of dollars doing abatement and environmental to tear down walls and ceilings to really try to figure out what's behind those walls. Um, so again, that's just perspective of you could spend it before the bond passes to really get the right design. Um, but I think when you take a look at the $18.8 million for Conant, you know, this is obviously a change that was you know, not necessarily um, anticipated for that for the Mansart roof. The amount of work that it would have taken to get us up to speed to find out what we we're working with would have been significantly better than the this type of event that comes up in the it's absence of an MEP Correct. drawing that's up to date. Correct. Okay. Any other comment? No. Um, my only other comment is uh, it's paid for by the 2020 bond fund. Our agenda got cut off and reads 202 bond fund just on our paperwork. <laughs> yeah, so. it does say that. Uh, but other than that, uh, I don't have any questions or comments. Our formatting's off tonight. Yeah. Okay. All right. Ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item 11F, 
Request to approve classroom technology for North and South Middle Schools. Dave Shulkin. I move the Board of Education to approve the purchase of classroom technology for North and South Hills Middle Schools for a total of $218,801.50. Award is to be paid from the bond funds. Second. Second. Any discussion? Not for me. So Dave, what's the content here? Uh, we're talking about classroom technology. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, so this will be this will include document cameras, uh, monitors for our staff as well as students, and then a uh, laptop that will be for say for the design tech labs at the middle schools. So that's what those include. Is is this the total that was in the original what the community voted on, two hundred eighteen thousand, or was it more? Cut back. Uh, ne neither. It was not captured because these are new, new spaces. So some of that pieces would have been captured that we had. Um, so for example, the specialty devices, which would be, say, those laptops for the students in those design labs, we had numbers for. But say, for example, monitors, we wouldn't put that in the bond program. We would know that those are, so for example, when you see, see a line item in the bond program, again, I, I want to re remind everybody, that blue book right, that we did was tech and facility assessments back in 2015 and 2018. That demonstrated our needs at that time. And then when we came to the board, part of the, part of the scope and design committee with the community was to say, hey, you're asking for X amount of dollars, show us that need. Those are what that showed at that time. So in 2018, these were the needs we had. Keep in mind, we had not even, you can't even, you can't design something until you start spending money for it. So we don't have designs of Ingenuity Labs what does the design tech lab look like from 2018 to today? And so when you go through those processes, you're gonna to have to have, you're gonna have changes to that. And so when we look at, when you look at what we promised the community, the community was, we are going to have devices, systems in place to support the curriculum and those spaces as designed. And in this case, in this particular case, we are meeting those, those needs, and that is my recommendation. So, so this is a two, so again, to, Put it in layman's term. This is a two hundred eighteen thousand dollar change order. No, to meet this, the needs. This is, no. So what was in the original bond of this two hundred eighteen thousand? And what do we? Th this was. Th yeah, I I don't have that in front of me. Yeah, I don't have that in front of me. So, why don't? Um, what what is so? So yeah. So what, what, is what, this? what this is is um, it looks like. Um, 140 hover cams. Mm -hmm. Those are document cameras. So for our, for our teachers. Okay. So what do those do? That's yeah. No, it's a great you question. So <laughs> like when you're in a when you're in a classroom, and so uh, let's say we're doing uh, math, which is a great a great example for hover or uh, document cams. That's a particular brand that they're talking about. And so I may think about when many of us, at least me, when I went to school, many of you were younger, we may have had like overhead projector. Same kind of similarity. So where we may have, hey, I'm going to show you this problem. You also might have, John, I want you to come up here and I want you to show the rest of the class what you're doing. And so that provides a way to kind of extend, but it's also digital. So I can put it on other boards. I can engage some other software with it. I actually can telestrate differently. So it's a little bit more dynamic than say an overhead projector. Um, the second item is uh, some monitors and sound boards. Yeah. Uh, what, what are those exactly? Yeah, so when you think about uh, our staff and students, so when they're gonna have a workstation or a, a, a laptop or whatever it might be, they need monitors and sound bars so they can hear the content that might be on their computer. And so when we're looking at those, those in general are for our staff. And so when they're in their classroom, they need an additional monitor because they have a laptop currently. And so this would provide them a monitor to help them manage their space and their workflow normally. And we currently do that. That's not something new or different than we currently do. So, and again, getting back, I'm, I'm sorry, John, are you done oh, with Oh, I was just gonna go through all, so, and then the others are the workstations and the laptops, and those are like coding quality computers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What is it, those are bulky, I like them, but are they, is it for like AutoCAD, or what, what kind of, yeah, what are they doing? Yeah, so think about the design tech lab is kind of pushing those specs way high, yeah. and so when you think about, uh, you've got AutoCAD, you've got uh, stuff that's not only in the cloud, but also on the client side, right. where you've got to kind of have that beefed up RAM, that beefed up, graphics. Yeah. And so when we think about the curriculum and then also the future, so you're buying this now so you also can, as that kind of grows and expands, you're going to you're going to need to kind of have that horsepower and you won't have to replace it in two years. It'll last a little bit longer. 
So, Dave, back to, I think, Paul's original question. Yeah. I presume we had some quantity of hardware mm -hmm. um, projected from 2018. Yeah. Um, how does that compare with the quantities shown here? Sure. We'll yeah, come I, to the I don't have right? that in front of me, yeah. Siva. Okay. I'd have to get that it for is, you. I guess, Paul, uh, I mean, I guess that's, that's the question, right, is are we using stuff in the bond fund that we did not, that the community didn't vote on? I guess that's the question. No, I mean, and you, the, qu the answer is no, no. So when, so that's so when we question. have those numbers, and, I, and I, want you to, I want you to think about something. The technology side, those numbers were at that time, but more importantly, we have a bucket. We have technology. And in that bucket, you have those spaces, safety, security, classroom technology, staff, right, and non-instructional technologies. Those are the buckets. The, you, the line item you're looking for, I'd have to go look to see if that matches up or not. We have a bucket that we're keeping with that budget. This is not any forecast above or beyond what we currently had planned for devices in those spaces. But to answer your exact question, I don't know the answer without having to go back to the book and looking at what we had exactly in the number. Yeah, I, I think we can match up. I mean, in, in the bond document, the one, the 200 page one, <laughs> I think it is, um, there is a space for like classroom technology, and then there's a space for student and, and teacher technology. This might cover both, but I think um, that it's possible for us to match as, this as up. As long as, and again, I'm, it's, it's, I'm sorry that he left, Paul, you know, our owner's rep, as long as we're not just throwing things now and calling it the 2020 bond to pay for things that we originally did not allocate because that would be a change order. Right. right? I so mean, I'm asking, I'm just asking a fiscally responsible question. Yeah. yeah. And, and the scope, is, so the scope of what we're asking for is no different than what we had in the bond program. Okay. But the number, I couldn't tell you, I'd have to look at that number. Okay. Yeah. I'm pretty familiar with that document and I, and I, I would say, the, right. the, the only thing I would say is that um, an item like uh, whatever it is, the uh, document scanner, might not be specifically laid out only because maybe four years ago we didn't use those. And you know what I mean? So, cost was, and we, no. we wouldn't even know how, like, and, I, and I get I, what you're saying. It is nice to go back and say, did we at least at bare minimum say we're going to have, you know, coding labs with workstations for the students, workstation, and then the hollow, you know, hover cam or whatever. I think that's going to be spelled out. We're not going to know we were going to have 70s, 70s. Maybe we wouldn't even known then because that model no. may not have existed. But to your point, yeah, we should my, go back my, and see what the original intent was. Between da and I'm sorry to say, you know, between David, our owner's rep, and Barton Mallet saying we allocated two million to go for these things. These things are outdated, so we're taking that money and we're spending it here because this is now state of the art. Wait, it's for not, staff. but it's so not outdated. That is not what I'm this, this is not, this is not new, the recommendation. This yeah. is new stuff, right? I mean, correct, correct me. Like this is, this is a coding correct. lab. Yeah. We're not replacing laptops. It, that is or correct. workstations out. In the bond, I'm assuming we're going to have a spot in there that says some kind of STEM initiative for students to do AutoCAD or you know, design, whatever it is, all these programs, maybe it's the 3D modeling, whatever it is, we, we probably have something in there. We probably have a dollar amount. What that dollar amount is, right. David can find out and we'll see. But even if we do have something, who knows? I, the prices, I mean, the prices aren't real from that. There's just no way that real that's realistic. 2018, uh, our, our Chromebooks went up by, I think, 35%, right? right? So mean, just the, the reality, so I'm, I'm, just to answer the question, the real, this is new stuff. This is in the scope of the bond. This is what was, you know, is basically outlined in there. We're, no one's losing anything. It's actually completing what we promised, both in the design, our curriculum and what we did in the bond. Okay. As long as you, our owner's rep, can validate that this is within the scope of the bond, it's not now, after the fact, people coming saying, I, I, uh, you know, a wish list. I wish we had this. All right, we'll just put it as part of the 2020 bond. As long as that's not what's going on, I'm fine. And then also one nuance to understand. So sometimes in those numbers, and I know you look at those numbers, you might say, hey, Dave, you got a number, let's just say it's 400 bucks. You're like, well, Dave, I can get Best Buy, I can get this for 325. Also note that in some of those, because we're the granularity of this, when you apply for the bond and you do this process, I'm not putting, you might see the licensing, you might see the case for a device. That we build right into that price. 
So you might not get the granularity, hey, Dave, you're going to order 60 cases for $60. Oh, now I start doing the math. I get how this works out. Again, you know, we knew that we needed to have those numbers that would include licensing cases and the support materials. Because I'm not going to put on there, hey, we're going to order 500 keyboards and mice. They're part of that system, right. if that makes sense. Um, like, uh, just for another example, there is a line item, uh, say for Conan, that says document camera, okay? Yeah. The 30, right? And so at the time, we presume they would cost $450. Um, I'm not sure what this is. We're, we're getting them cheaper. Right. <laughs> and so we. It's one thing we this got. This says 140 which covers K through eight classrooms, so it's presumably six schools. It I, goes back I'm just the, saying it does match it goes, up. You know, yeah, I, I looked it at goes it. back to the fundamental details, right. right? It's either in the bond right, or it's a change order, right? So right. I just would need and to know it's in the bond. saying it's in the bond, and that's fine. In the bond. Yeah. I mean, it's not specifically called a hover game, but it's there, I think. That's, all right. Yeah, because that's a particular brand, and we would right. never do that, yeah. Right. Okay. Any other discussion? No. Ready to vote on this? Yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes 6 0. And then the next item, uh, 11G, request to approve the IAPTIA gym AV system purchase. This is the. This is Okay. I'll All right. Motion. Okay. Get this down. I move the Board of Education approve the purchase of AV technologies totaling 35000 from the Oak Miss Campus Gym. The total includes, includes awards to the Third Coast Tech LLC for the procurement installation and installation of the AV system, awards to be paid using the IA PTIA funds. Second. Right, and the discussion, discussion. well, the discussion was, and I think we, we, had, we, we discussed this at the study session, is why are we approving money coming out of the PTIA funds? Because we have to. Because we, <laughs> yeah, we have, I just didn't, you know, I, I don't what's, know. What's the, do you remember, we talked about the study session, there's a reason. Know, it has to do with uh, the fact that it would be an asset on our property that we right. have to right. ensure, we have to, okay. like, maintain that kind of thing. If it's an asset on our property, we have to approve it. So we're taking a fixed asset and it has a value that net value exceeds the state bid threshold. Right. So therefore we're complying with the state bid threshold by having the board formally approve this. In addition, the board would typically approve donations coming in to ensure equity between buildings and programs. And that's a good point. There's a, there's a donation as part of this as well from our vendor. Right. That's fine. I saw the existing setup last night. That was rough. <laughs> I, could, I couldn't see <laughs> it. Um, yeah. That's fine. So I'm good. We can All right. Proceed. Any other discussion? No. Ready to vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you. All right. Next item. Item 11H, request to support or disapprove Oakland Schools' proposed FY24 general budget. Uh, so I am the uh, board designate from Bloomfield Hills to the Oakland School District. So the general fund um, has a budget of $24.5 million, I believe. Uh, uh, 24.540 million, uh, and we're being asked to approve the budget. Uh, last year's budget was 27.245 million. Uh, there's a 117-page document, which is included in your package. And so we're looking at pages 39 and 37 and 38 of that 117 page document, um, or summarized version, it's probably page 36, there's four line items in the middle of the page which says expenditures. So expenditures include general administration of 2 million and 51,000, finance and operations of 9.42 million, instructional services of 11.1 million, which increased from last year, uh, and then plant and fixed charges, which decreased significantly from last year. So last year's total was 27.2 million, and this year's total is 24.54 million. 
Uh, the reason the plant and fix charges came down by six million uh, after the Oxford incident, um, there was funding put in for putting security devices in a number of the, or all of the school districts. And so that number last year was inflated. Um, since that project has already been funded, the construction or implementation will go on through this year, but that's been already funded. So there's no more request in the plant and fixed charges, so that's why that number came down. In um, instructional services, the number went down from, or went up from 8.7 million to 11.1 .1 million, an increase of about 1.8. And a lot of that was for the wellness fund that Paul, you had asked questions about. Yes. Um, uh, the details according to Oakland schools was that this is basically funds they're asking for approval so they can hire additional consultants for mental well-being and support to all 28 school districts. And we'll get a piece of that. The way I'm was explained to me we would have to apply and they would give us a portion of that, of those resources, so, of that so 1.8 million based on our needs. So, so Is that a fair statement? So, yes. so they're asking us, right, not just us, but all of Oakland all County, to approve districts. for another 2 million, then for all the districts to apply to get money back. back. It's not something so they're gonna why, keep. So, yeah, so why would, why? <laughs> no, they Why have, ask for more money and then for us to apply for the money? It's, it just doesn't they, make sense. They, so. they have to, the way it was explained to me, they have to get us to approve the budget for them to hire the resources or get money before they can go hire resources. It, it does. To send it back to us. They can't do it after the fact. They have to have the resources available to send to us on hand. So a little bit of the chicken and the egg. I, or I just it. give us all the money and we don't have to approve a budget to go to them and ask for them for the money. The, the, the reason mm -hmm. they are doing it centrally, again, according to uh, Pam in, in the depart finance department, was that they don't see a need for these intervention counselors on a full-time basis through the course of a year for all 28 school districts. They see them as being required on a part-time basis, um, and they don't see that individual districts need to necessarily go hire these people. How do they come up with that? When, I mean, Pat, exactly. when Pat has said, like, we have a defined need to hire so more, Pat, more maybe mental you can health explain. resources, I don't, it, I don't it, get that. It's, I can explain the mental health need, I can't explain someone else's budget. Yeah, yeah I, think, I, I get guess that. The All right, so, yeah, the please uh, try to explain. What, what, why would there be a need centrally as opposed to us having those resources here in our own district? Well, we've applied for mental health grants and we received grants, you know, whether it was for the therapy dogs or to add it, you know, we've added additional social workers, so there's been a need. Again, it would be inappropriate for me to speak to someone else's budget. I'm not in those meetings. I, I haven't studied the book back and forth. I, so I guess I, not so much a question on the budget, but if you're looking for resources, do you believe that we're better off putting those resources in our district ourselves, or are you better off pulling them in from Oakland schools as required? I guess, because that's what they're telling us. I don't know if it's an option for us to receive the funds directly or not. What I can say is anytime there are funds available or grants, you know, Karen and her team have applied for everything that's possible out there. And we've shared that with the board, all the grants we've received left and right. Those, there's nothing that goes for that's unapplied. I, again, I can't speak to whether that can just be allocated directly or not. But if there's opportunity, whether it's Oakland schools or through the federal government to apply for anything that benefits students, um, you know, we'll go ahead and we'll apply and try to secure those funds regardless. My fundamental problem with this budget, right, is, you know, you, you asked, like, I sent questions, you said you had similar questions, you got an answer, like, two hours ago. I mean, two hours ago, it's a 119-page document. They really, what they should do 
is they should have a representative come to a study awesome. session I agree. and give us a PowerPoint. And I that think was the note I made I, is we should have I, somebody. I in think, here. I, and I'm, you know, I'm personally I'm voting no on this because I don't think they're transparent at all at what they're doing. They throw a budget. Here's 120 pages. You're not going to read it, so you you might as well pass it. And I don't, I don't, I don't operate that way. So. Um, Kieran, if I may ask, um, is there a deadline from Oakland schools to get approval? June 1st. <laughs> I mean, so why aren't they here? I mean, why aren't they here at our meeting answering our questions? This is as talk about we transparency. Be able to speak to this that is as, for them no, I'm not saying this is rhetorical, but I'm just saying, and maybe they're listening and watching, which I doubt. But I'm just, but I'm just saying that you know. So I think this is as little transparent as possible. So I can't trust, vote on this. Trustee Poland, when mm -hmm. they do put the budget out and have the, de the deadline, it comes out in early May. Usually, it gives almost a full 30 days. They offer up. They have a presentation to the superintendents group. They have a presentation to the business official group, and they invite the four elected liaisons from each district to come to a special presentation. I think that was set up. Actually, they put this out in April because I think the date of that was April 24th. So unfortunately, Civil was not able to attend that. But they do have an opportunity with board trustees can go there, ask specific questions, and sit in on the presentation. So there is an opportunity. Uh, I, yeah. I think, yes, I, you know, I've been remiss in, in reaching out of them early enough. But to Tarek's point, you know, I'm a finance person. It took me a while to go through and wade through all the detail. It's impossible. And it's, it's ridiculous that they're not putting a summarized presentation for, you know, a board member to understand what they're asking. Not, not even just a board member. My feedback to Oakland schools would be, it would be nice if we don't want to have somebody here, fine. But there should be a summarized version, not just for us, but for the community to know Hey, here's what we're doing in terms of mental health. Here's what we're doing in terms of what you know, what, math, whatever it is. Like, there should be a couple bullet points what this budget represents. Because for me, I looked at it when I first got it, and I'm still trying to digest it. I know you highlighted those areas, but I can't. Great. I keep asking questions. What does this object code mean? What does this mean? And I have to go to Google, and I could go back and forth with them, but what would be really helpful is if we had just even a two-page document for the community for us to say, here's what we're proposing for Oakland schools. I mean, that it just, I don't even know how to vote on something like this because I still have so many questions. And I feel, I'm sure they have good interests, but have they taken feedback from school districts like us where we say what would be better is if we had the full-time mental health resource inside of, you know, in our district rather than just, pulling from. One of the things, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, one of the things that just remind me talking about that, like a, the big program, which I wish they would expand upon and spend more money on, if we had opportunity to have dialogue, would be the CTE, pro, you know, CTE program, you know, that they have. And that I would like to see more, I, I would like to have like dialogue, not come to some, in the defensive service, some meeting wherever it was right. in an hour and ask questions with 30 people, you're not going to get your real questions in. They should be coming to the board meetings and having dialogue with board members, and we have an opportunity to have more type of questions. I don't even know what Civic could have got out of that meeting for an hour and a half. Uh, I do recall, this is my third summer on the board, I think, and we had no more visibility in prior years. No. If, if anything, we had less visibility in prior years than we did this year when we talked about it in the years prior, right? So it's, it's a general problem that they're not uh, addressing. with Oakland schools on, on visibility or, or simplifying things, clearly. They know what they're talking about, but they're not simplifying it for us. My recommendation would be for the board to take a vote and then it is yep. what it is, and then send feedback to Dr. Southward regarding improvements you'd like to see regarding the budget or things you'd like me to share with Oakland schools, and then I will share that with Oakland schools. Yep. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to make one quick comment. It does spell out some of the mental health work that they do. It would be mm -hmm. nice to know how often and where they gave those services to, so I know where the money's going to. I mean, it would be nice to have you know, just some more information. The one, the one thing I did find out, and it took a while to find this out, is their CTE program, like each class, yeah. 
regardless of your enrollment, so let's just say we have 5,000, Walled Lake has 12,000, you only get a certain amount of seats per district, regardless of your enrollment, which I don't even think is equitable. I mean, that's something, hmm. you know, that I think I would even bring up that they should revisit. But that's just one thing. But you're right, we do have some questions. Okay. And again, this is to uh, pass a vote on their general fund. Um, the bulk of the funds we get from Oakland schools is for special ed. That's mm -hmm. probably like probably of of the thir twelve to thirteen million we get from Oakland schools, about two hundred comes from the two hundred K comes from the general fund. The bulk of it goes for special ed to the tune of about twelve to thirteen million. I guess to maybe we just vote at this point. All right, so let's just go ahead and take a vote. Um, again, my feedback would be vote yes or no today. We'll see what shakes out, but we definitely need to get them in for a study session. We'll work with Rebecca to work that into our schedule for the year. Okay. So um, let's go around the room. All in favor? No. Any in favor? <laughs> I mean, if I say no, let me ask this. By voting no, does it hold anything up? Because it's due June 1st. I mean, what are the repercussions if there's a no vote back to I open schools? I think where, a number of districts have passed and voted no and there was no impact. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I obviously don't want to do anything detrimental. That, that's my, Our goal so, is that's to take time. We're not right? going to do anything detrimental to our students by yeah. doing this, correct? That's, okay. So is I would that say, fair? In the past when we voted no one time, <laughs> But it didn't cause anything. I'm all not right. sure if the flavor of the county were to all vote no, what that would do to right. we're, we're, we're to, to that point. We're one of, but still, it it, but it sends a message that we, we're not just going to rubber stamp something. It may still pass, right, if the majority of districts pass it, and I don't know where everyone else stands, but this sends a message that you need to be more transparent. And I think word will get out to other districts as, you know, we yeah. may lead this in saying, yeah, we do agree you need to be more transparent. Um, Should we take a roll call vote? Yep. I can't recall why I was convinced. I mean, this is the same stuff we got last we, night. Same stuff so we got last I'm like, I asked a bunch I, of questions last year. I, I'm wondering, did Howard convince me it was okay? I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out why <laughs> I was convinced before that uh, to vote yes. Um, so. We, we, in that, uh, I, I that, do remember we debated yeah. less last couple yeah, of years. Right? Yeah, I've brought it up in the last couple of years that I'm just, well, we, I don't you know, know. whatever. But <laughs> we, 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 we could do a roll call though. All right, see what All right. Uh, Tariq? Uh, no. No. John? No. I have a no. 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 <laughs> All right, unanimous, 6-0. Vote no. Okay. All right. All right. Um, All right, item. 11i board and turn program committee recommendation. Your motion. I'm, I move the board of education to appoint students G and L as board interns and students F, S, M, N, and U as the student advisory council for the 2023-2024 school year. Second. So just to kind of outline and I thank, she's not here, Rebecca immensely. She made it as painless as possible for us, even though we did spend a lot of time. So there were a um, significant amount of applications this year. We interviewed all the candidates over the course of two days. So credit to my colleagues, myself, and again, most importantly, Rebecca, who gave us a you know foolproof like link where we would just go in, interview for 10 minutes, go out, interview for 10 minutes. She rescheduled everything. We all went through the application process. We all went through the letters of intent. Um, we basically had a scoring system, and then the three of us got on a call after we went through the scoring system to kind of just hammer it out, make sure we're all on the same page. So we spent a couple of days ago going through that, and you know the process went smooth, and we pretty much collaborated on unanimously who were the two board interns. They were GNL, and then who were the student advisory council members, F, S, M, N, and U. They'll all be contacted by, Rebecca has an email that she's drafted. I'm gonna have her circulate that to the board. Three, um, three types of emails, the emails for the board interns, the email for the advisory council members, and the emails for the students that were not selected. 
nothing against for the students who do eventually, and we're gonna do it 30th after the holiday weekend, who didn't, I mean, they, again, all 21, we just can't have 21 I people wish we on, the, on the, we can't have 21 advisory, yeah. we can't have two board interns and 19 advisory council members. If we would, we could, we just can't. I was blown um, away by, yeah. I mean, I no, know they're, they're Trustee very, Hill and Colin, the same thing, like every single student in their own way blew us away with, yep. you know, how eloquently they spoke about their experience, about what they want to bring to their community, such diverse representation in terms of who they are, what they like, you know, what they aspire to do, all their ideas. I mean, yeah, I wish we had 21 spots for, I mean, they're amazing students. We're they, really lucky to have them. They had 10 minutes. They all filled out an application, um, a letter of intent, a resume. They had to get sign off. And then on spur of the moment, be available for a 10-minute interview. And we all know, if we've all been through interviews, 10 minutes is not a lot of time when we're asking three quick questions. Yeah. And they all did a great they job. Did great. So That was awesome. Yeah. Yep. That's it. Any questions? Just vote. Oh, now we just vote. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 So Any opposed? No. So, so the next step is they'll, we'll invite them, right? We'll invite both at the next meeting, which um, at the next, whether it's a study session and what we'll coordinate, the old interns to kind of thank them if they can make it, and then the new interns, if they can't make it, we even told them during the interview process, they were even, 